Okay, I'm Nigel Shadbolt, and uh, I'm, yeah, I've got to not talk out too loud, haven't I? Because it uh, sounds, sounds loud. <laughs> okay. Is it? Okay, that's fine. Good. Are you comfortable? Yeah, that's fine. Marvelous. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Good. Justin. See you.
Good morning. Oh, that's, that's the attitude. I love it. Fantastic. Um, I uh, am still Hannah Blue, and you are still Wikimania, and we have some very exciting speakers to start for this morning. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt. He is a chairman and co-founder of the Open Data Institute, which works to catalyze the evolution of open data culture to create economic, environmental, and social value. He's also professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Southampton. With over 400 publications, he has researched on topics ranging from cognitive psychology to computational neuroscience, artificial intelligence to the semantic web. He was one of the originators of the interdisciplinary field of web science and is a director of the Web Science Trust, which seeks to advance our understanding of the web and promote the web's positive impact on society. It was announced last month that Professor Shadbolt will become the next principal of Jesus College, Oxford. And today, he's, he's going to be giving us a social machine perspective on Wikipedia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here and uh, talking to you. Um, I have a, um, many slides. Um, hopefully, they will reveal themselves when they switch over, um, and I can uh, get into the talk. So, is there any signal from the slides? <laughs> Okay, there we go. Great. Um, so um, the reason um, I put this slide up is to just uh, be clear about my affiliation. I work uh, at the University of Southampton, where I'm a professor of AI, but I also am chairman of the Open Data Institute. Um, I'll be talking today quite a lot about a particular line of research that we have supported by the um, Engineering and Physical Research Council, um, um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, uh, to look at what we call social machines. And I'll try and express why they're important, exciting, and why Wikipedia falls into that class. So that project is called Socium. Social machines, socium, it's a, a Latin form of, of sociability. Um, and I want to start with the following observation. We know that sensors are going to be everywhere. Um, the Internet of Things is much lauded, much heralded. It's arriving very quickly. But also, everyone's going to be a sensor with your mobile phones and your, or your Google Glass or whatever your particular kind of uh, health uh, Fitbit. Uh, you'll be generating data. Interestingly, that data often um, reveals interesting structure just by virtue of you generating it. Uh, here on the, um, um, on the right of that screen, you can actually see a, um, uh, an outline for more or less of the city of London. And that's formed by each black dot is a pixel representing, a dot representing a geocode of a Flickr uh, geocode, a photograph that was taken and then uploaded to the Flickr system. Uh, people obligingly tag those uh, 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 photographs, and in fact, you can not only see the outlines quite clearly of London, the bridges, the River Thames there, the main thoroughfares, but you can very quickly discern what the 20 top, um, top uh, visited tourist attractions are. We generate data at scale all the time, and when we can assemble it, we can gain really interesting insights from it. Now, uh, you'll see from some of the following slides that we can absolutely, uh, we can absolutely uh, do remarkable things by mobilizing people together with this uh, machine fabric that we now have around us. Uh, the famous uh, DARPA balloon challenge uh, um, was uh, uh, a challenge put out in the U.S. to find and locate 10 balloons tethered somewhere in the continental United States, an objective that was achieved within a day, and actually it taught us huge amounts about how you can effectively assemble people at scale to solve a problem. So anyone can be a sensor in this world. People are actually going out there and looking for these things and reporting back via social uh, media uh, platforms um, as, as to whether they were locating them or not. Anyone could be an author. Wikipedia is a great testament uh, to that fact. Um, 
Everyone can be a scientist. This is um, uh, Hanny um, uh, Van Ackel's uh, 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 discovery, um, a Dutch uh, teacher of a new kind of galaxy in the Zooniverse um, uh, project run out of Oxford that was actually uh, looking to classify large numbers of objects that were being sent down and streamed down in, in uh, imagery from the um, uh, sky uh, survey. No uh, experts were uh, available in enough numbers to be able to solve this task. So they were able to train using this platform citizens to make these distinctions. Many of you here may have participated in these citizen science projects. And the extraordinary thing is that amidst all those volunteer efforts, real science gets done, real insights are made. So uh, Hanny van Ackel discovering a new kind of, of galaxy in this case. Anybody can be an innovator on this open web. This is, of course, the, one of the poster uh, uh, examples of this is Jack Andraka's work where he used a range of resources available to him to build a very cheap paper-based uh, sensor for detecting various forms of cancer. And everyone knows something. Um, this is the example of Ushahidi, where, again, using a very simple but widely distributed system of texting and geographic uh, placement of uh, reports on a, a map, uh, people were able to report in on the Kenyan riots, a platform that was developed using open source capability, widely deployed, and has been reused and repurposed. And all of this is, of course, because of an open web, a universal web to some extent decentralized, supporting net neutrality with open standards, an open platform, and uh, another key theme of the Wikimania conference is going to be this idea of open data. So we're seeing remarkable uh, um, assemblies of individuals collectively with machines, with data, with tasks to hand to solve problems collectively. And this gave rise to this term, social machines. And in fact, Tim Berners-Lee had uh, noticed this in his book, Weaving the Web. He talks of the fact that real life is full of all kinds of social constraint, uh, the actual process from which society arises. And if we can use computers to support some of the um, um, abstract social um, uh, processes that we engage in, and if the machines are doing the administration, the people are doing the creative stuff, you could get a whole new class of what he called social engines. So this is the term social machine. And the social machines we see around us um, range from the mundane to the extraordinary, from Twitter on the one hand to the example of Ushahidi. And why I'm as an academic interested uh, uh, fundamentally, and increasingly numbers, uh, increasing numbers of us are in this area, is that it's largely neglected in computer science. The most important and impressive systems that are deployed in some sense on the planet are largely uh, ill understood. And, and we kind of characterize this in this diagram where you can think of conventional computing and conventional computing research over in the left hand side, that blue block there. Increasing amounts of data compute and data complexity, maybe, but all the action is in a world which increasingly comprises social computation. People co authoring encyclopedic content, people networking on Facebook people thinking about how they could coordinate their activities at really large scale to solve the problems that face us. But this is not an area that is well understood. How do these social machines arise? Why do they thrive? And why might they decline? Those are the questions we're asking. And it is the basis of this collaborative research between Edinburgh University, University of Southampton and the University of Oxford to try and get our heads around this challenge. So then, our characterization of social means is to recognize that they are not governed by pure algorithms, by formal specifications that computer scientists have traditionally written, but by collective social processes. And they're some kind of amalgam of individual action and coordination. And the web infrastructure mediates that. Now, this is interesting because we can begin to develop a checklist. And again, um, I expect you to be taking in all of this uh, on the slides, but I'll certainly be making these available for people to kind of have a reflect on. What are their properties? 
Not present in all systems, but you can say that many of these systems are solved by the scale of human participation. You've got to get people to work together in a timely fashion. And as you participate, you're incentivized to participate more because other people are participating as well and the net benefit to everybody grows through time. You've got to have confidence in the quality of the data. Interestingly, one of the real challenges in many of the systems that are built is to know, of course, you would know better than many in the Wikimedia and Wikipedia world, is to how to, you can trust the quality of data. And in the agents and processes that underpin the generation of data. But this is pervasive and widespread in all of our social machines. We need intuitive interfaces that are user-centric. We need systems that work across platforms, typically social machines that are effective do. Efficient, effective, and equitable. Interestingly, the values that are present in many of the most successful social machines, uh, I would argue, are beginning to exploit the power of open. Open source, open standards, open data, and open licensing. Now, there are plenty of social machines that don't tick all of those boxes, and we, can, we, 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 we know that. But we also know that this isn't like the traditional computing system of Turing. This is not the traditional system studied in most computer science labs. Um, Turing machines um, uh, are very well bounded formally, but our social machines do contain algorithmic components, but there's no idea of a complete specification at the outset. They evolve and develop. It achieves more effect as more people participate. It doesn't actually have a notion of completeness very often. So you can't say the job is done. It's continuous. There's no equivalent of the halting <laughs> characterization of a traditional system. And it won't even have a notion of correct output in a very stringent sense very often. Now, these are really interesting features of our social machines. And again, they pose challenges to us as researchers. So fundamentally, what we are beginning to do is to understand how we can notice them, observe them, describe them, classify them, perhaps even anticipate them, and better design and engineer them. That is the challenge we face. Well, we've been working closely with the University of Oxford and our colleagues, particularly uh, Chris Lintot's group, in, in the um, Zooniverse projects. This is this whole area where platforms are being built to support citizen science. Again, we've had um, great access to this data, and it's allowed us to begin to do some analysis. Analysis at scale. And we've been particularly interested in looking at how in these projects, people don't just do the task they're given, they begin to discuss. This is a fascinating feature of social machines, is that despite the best intentions of the designers, users will subvert, develop, augment, and extend the systems. So there were very little support in many of the early citizen science projects for discussion between people who were meant to be given a task, classify this galaxy. Is it one of these or one of those? But people began to discuss anyway. They began to share resources. They came up with their own um, assets to share. And they began to participate to the point at which, increasingly, uh, they um, uh, become first-class citizens in this world. One of the things we've been looking at is not just the structure of the discussion spaces to understand how we can engineer for better support for this in the future, where that wasn't anticipated originally. Of course, this was built into the DNA uh, pretty well of Wikipedia, but in the citizen science projects here, it wasn't. So how can you learn from that? We've also been looking at how you motivate people, how you understand their motivations. So here, more, uh, reasonably recently, the notion of ribbons has been uh, almost a medal bar for your achievements and participation in various citizen science projects, and trying to get a sense from people of why they participate in one more than others. So that sense of what motivates people to be able to collect it at source. Uh, the other thing we notice when we look at these projects is how quickly people uh, change and develop 
the characteristics of expertise in the domain. So this was a particular uh, uh, project where they were looking to um, analyze photographs from the seabed to get an idea of marine uh, biodiversity. And uh, thousands and thousands of photographs and people were annotating it with all sorts of terms that seem like the terms you and I would immediately use. Looks like, see, scallops, things, images, right, left. Within weeks, that vocabulary had developed substantially into significant domain expertise as people pour resources and effort and attention into the exercise. So this is very much about a collection phase, building the capability to analyze and notice these interactions at scale. And the citizen science projects have been a good place for us to start. We've been building web observatories to, 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 to make this process more automatic with the systems out there that make their data available to us. We've been coming up with ways to describe and classify these systems. And we've also noticed that these systems are not alone. Of course, they live in an ecosystem. So the really interesting question to ask ourselves in these contexts is, how does one social machine relate to another? How do the various components of these systems relate? And actually, insights from uh, ecology turn out to be quite interesting. You can quite literally see examples of the ecology of social machines in terms of the structure of the environment, the producers and consumers in the digital space of social machines the various traits they have, um, the extent to which they are similar, um, the way they might actually vary from one another, um, and how uh, actually systems adapt. Do they co-evolve? Do they compete? Do they cooperate? Do some become extinct? Now, these insights uh, provide a very rich descriptive vocabulary for looking at our systems. And we can take a similar system with uh, a view, systems view with Wikipedia. And our work that we're beginning now to understand uh, and try and apply some of our methods to the uh, Wikipedia environment uh, are already furnishing some very interesting insights. So we can recognize that Wikipedia exists and the Wikimedia projects and activities exist within a larger um, ecosystem. The question we're looking to ask is, is how, um, how do we understand its various success and challenge criteria? So um, from a, an initial start where increasingly uh, more and more capability has been uh, included within the um, wiki world, what are we seeing happen? Well, of course, famously, just a couple of years ago, a, a paper appeared, a study by um, uh, Aaron uh, Halfacker on, uh, and colleagues on whether or not we needed to worry about the health of Wikipedia. And this is all the notion about the um, editor decline. The number of active editors uh, 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 over time seem to be declining, certainly in the English language Wikipedia. And was this a cause for concern? But it's important to be clear as to whether we know that when we look at this, we're, we're, we're measuring the real pulse of Wikipedia uh, and these, these efforts, the real pulse of the social machine in question. And so what we've been doing is um, looking also at areas, so, um, um, uh, distinct areas where there is clearly um, large amounts of activity. And the Wikipedia projects is one we've been looking at. So we've looked at uh, the analysis. We wanted to understand how these self-organizing communities were working and the extent to which they were vibrant and uh, why they formed in the first place. Uh, can they tell us anything at all about the health of Wikipedia in general? And as we look at this, we can begin to see um, the, uh, the connected graph of contributors between projects, whether they're editors or discussants, whether there's crossover between these topics. It turns out to be a very interesting graph to analyze, a very highly connected graph, in fact. Um, and as we start to look at the dynamics more closely, we can actually see, um, interestingly, uh, 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 temporal phenomena. So I'm going to show you now a, um, this is an animation. It's a log-log plot uh, of total discussions as opposed to total edits across all um, wiki projects. So you're going to see the growth over time of edits and discussions and Wikipedians in terms of the size of the bubble to give you a sense of, of where the activity is in this area. So let's just do that. 
So here we go. We can actually see um, in time now. Um, this is uh, this is 2004. We have relatively little activity. We'll let let it run forward. We can see the projects emerging: 2007, 2008, 10, 11, 12. You can see this really interesting flourishing of activity as people both edit and discuss and build connected communities. This is not a community in decline as you look at these sorts of interactions. Of course, there's very much the question of how you get people motivated, how you keep them enrolled, how you bring high-class contributors, uh, valuable contributors, whether you incentivize them correctly. So many of the points that Aaron Halthaker made in the paper still stand, but it's also important to look at various aspects of the health of the systems. And the other interesting question we're asking ourselves is whether or not uh, Wikipedia can be observed um, in a sense in a streaming fashion. So through time, how is Wikipedia actually interacting with systems outside it? How are systems of the social machines feeding back into it? Into it? And the question is, how do we notice? How do we do those experiments? How do we take the pulse of these social machines, the health of these social machines as they interact with one another? What data do we collect and how can we analyze it? Um, and, and I think this is really beginning to define a, a really important uh, research and activity agenda. And I just wanted to round out the, 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 the talk now with, with, the, with, with, with the another um, aspect of both my own passion and, and research area, which is this fundamentally important characteristic of a class of social machines which live by being open. So they live by being open around uh, either the software, the standards they use, the extent to which they participate, the extent to which they use open data and open licensing. This gives rise to the most valuable commodity I would submit that we have at our disposal uh, to face many of the problems we are faced with in the 21st century, this notion of open innovation. Um, and I know and, and the, the whole area of open data is a key theme in Wikimania this year, as is open scholarship. Um, it's interesting that essentially that same cycle of um, virtuous cycle of innovation applies uh, not just um, um, uh, for innovation, but also for scholarly research, open scholarship. If you have access, so you're essentially having to replace uh, um, 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 paid for uh, content for open access uh, scientific publication and you get huge benefits. The data itself um, that we're seeking to make open, there have been a whole range of discussions around um, the way in which new classes of data that are linked tightly together are emerging, the so-called linked of, uh, web of open data. We've got various uh, achievements under our belt in this country, in the UK. Some of the data released by the government is now available as high quality um, uh, linked data in, in a technical sense. We are now seeing the emergence of strong identifiers for certain features of our information space in the UK. The use of URIs for schools and postcodes and uh, uh, companies allows us to connect data at a very granular level, a very powerful level. Um, I can point you to example to the UK's Department for uh, Communities and Local Government site where huge amounts of its data is now published in this high-grade linked data fashion. That's leading to the emergence of a national information infrastructure uh, based around key open data assets. And one of the interesting questions, I think, that, uh, that is posed for efforts such as Wikipedia, such as the, um, um, uh, the various uh, considerations of the Wikimedia Foundation is, how can you lock into these open data assets and perhaps develop ways in which uh, Wikipedia uh, the, the, the Wikimedia uh, uh, products become key providers on access points to this high quality open data. Because there's no doubt it has value, whether it's in public health in the UK, here are examples of open data sets that are being released around mortality rates, how, why people and how people are dying in the UK, uh, how our hospitals are doing, how we're doing in areas of crime. And the Open Data Institute, which, uh, which I founded with, with, with Tim Berners-Lee, is very much about trying to understand how you can bring this data together to gain insight. And um, 
Our international development uh, director, Richard Sterling, is talking at the conference here this afternoon. Uh, we'll be talking about some of these issues further. All I would say is we can give you great examples of where this data is being used to gain insight, whether it's how people, how general practitioners prescribe drugs across the country, or the links between corporations, or indeed policy decisions around whether or not in this city the mayor should close fire stations in terms of whether the data suggests it will improve or, uh, or, or, or degrade the ability of a fire appliance to get to a particular situation. This use of data becomes extremely uh, valuable and material. And what we're looking to do in that context is certify um, open data. So one of the things we worry about a lot in the open data community is the idea of how good, what the quality of that data is. Where does it come from? Is it definitive? Does it have good provenance? And this relates very much, I would submit, to the... Um, uh, topic of, of, I think, of the next talk, which will be very much around um, how can data represented in a wiki context become definitive and authoritative? And to what extent can we actually make common cause between these various efforts, the work in the open data world and the work that the, uh, the uh, Wikimedia Foundation supports? So just finally, um, to remind us, there is a huge power in the power of open. Um, I've talked to you today about social machines as a new way of trying to understand uh, systems that use um, um, open data. Some, not all of them do, but many do. Um, and this is, uh, again, I think, important. What I want to end with is a, um, is a reflection on the fact that whatever we do here, whatever we do, our entire enterprise is founded on the concept of the open web. And uh, as Tim has eloquently said in the past, um, the goal of the web is to serve humanity and that we build it now so that those that come later will be able to create things that we cannot imagine ourselves. We must not do things that close down on those opportunities. And um, this seems to me a hugely important a hugely important uh, message to go out there to bat for. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, this idea of open doesn't relate just to the web. Niels Bohr, famously writing in the 50s, talked about an open world, a world in which, and this seems to be very much to the ethos that, again, Wikipedia and the Wikimedia uh, uh, Foundation really represents, is... Openness is the paramount issue. If we can provide access to the world's information in an equitable fashion, then you have one of the best ways of helping support uh, our progress uh, in the face of the challenges we confront. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shadbolt will now be available for a Q&A session in the foyer around this side if you'd like, if you have any burning questions you'd like to ask. Um, otherwise, I, it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker, uh, Lydia Pincher, who is the product manager for Wikidata, working for the Wikimedia Germany. And she has been with the project since the beginning in 2012. She started as the community liaison for Wikidata and is now in charge of product direction. Lydia is a member of the board of directors of KDE, the open source software and technology community, which has delivered over 200 individual projects and has over 5,000 contributors. She describes her role as helping people make awesome happen. Uh, please welcome Lydia Pincher.
heilen. Accesso, Vietza, Chayu. How many of you understood all of those words? Raise your hand. Jens is amazing. He knows a lot of languages. But other than him, no one understood all of this, right? This is a problem. Have a look at this map. This is articles on English Wikipedia with a geo-coordinate. The article about the Eiffel Tower gets one dot of light on this map. The article about the Barbican Center gets one dot of light on this map, and so on. As you can see, English Wikipedia covers a lot of knowledge. The world, you can see the whole world. Now let's take a look at the same map for French Wikipedia, or Italian Wikipedia, or Greek Wikipedia, or Turkish Wikipedia. This is a pr problem. We need to fix this. If you do not speak English, we do not give you access to a lot of vital information. We need to give more people more access to more knowledge. Now, my question to you is, how do we do this? What do we need to do to give more people more access to more knowledge? We need to translate Wikipedia. OK, what else? We need more money. Yes. We have to respect people more, yes. And one very important thing we have to do is innovate. Innovation means delving into unknown fields. Innovation means stretching your comfort zone. Innovation means challenging the status quo. Innovation means disruption. Innovation means sleepless nights. Innovation means facing up to fears, your own and others. And innovation means being able to imagine what doesn't even exist yet. And yes, innovation is painful. We've seen this again and again over the past months, even years in Wikimedia. And Wikidata is certainly no exception to this. But in order to give more people more access to more knowledge, we need to innovate. And let's take a look back 10 years at English Wikipedia. It certainly couldn't rival Encyclopedia Britannica. But oh man, can it today. And the very same thing will happen with Wikidata. Now, some of you are probably wondering, what is Wikidata? You've heard of Wikipedia. Wikimedia Commons, maybe. Let me tell you. Wikidata is a central knowledge base that holds data like the date of birth of the Queen of England, the number of inhabitants of London, the geo-coordinate of the Barbican Center, and much, much more. This data is then immediately made available to nearly 300 Wikipedias, over 200 sister projects, and anyone else out there who wants to make use of a large amount of useful structured data about our world. Now let's have a look at some of the things that Wikidata already makes possible today. It's a really excellent tool to scale our efforts. We have a decline in editors. And one thing we need to do is to enable the editors that we have to be more effective. And Wikidata does exactly that. It allows our editors to be more effective. Imagine you're writing an article about the London Eye in Gaelic language, which does not exist yet. Wikidata can already provide you with a lot of very useful information to get you started. Like, for example, when it was open to the public, 
where exactly it is, and links to images about it. One important piece of information that is still missing in Wikidata right now is the name of the architect of the London Eye. The moment someone adds this to Wikidata, it immediately becomes available to your article. But it also immediately becomes available to all other Wikipedias. But why stop there? Think bigger. It also immediately becomes available to all sister projects, like Wikivoyage, for example. But again, why stop at the borders of our movement? Think bigger. The moment you add it to Wikidata, it immediately becomes available to anyone else out there to use. Another thing Wikidata is helping us with is recruiting new editors. Since the start of the project, 10,000 new people who have never edited on any other Wikimedia project before have edited on Wikidata. We've opened up a whole new green field for them. How do we do this? For example, with little games. We have one, for example, that shows you the excerpt of a Wikipedia article and asks you, is this a person or not? Now, this is trivial for sure, but knowing that John Henry is not a person is important information that helps us keep our knowledge base clean. Another important thing we need to think about is reliability. We need to give more people more access to more knowledge, but the knowledge we, need to we give them access to should, of course, be correct. And every single day, stones get thrown in our way. Take, for example, Ben. He's a 15-year-old sitting in his high school's computer lab, bored, and changes Lisa Meitner's date of birth to 1818. This makes this amazing lady 150 years old. Well, Ben, I don't think so. Wikidata makes it a piece of cake to find such unlikely people over the age of 120, for example. Or how about Lego being married to Natalie Portman? Probably not. <clears throat> Wikidata, again, makes it easy to find such unlikely marriages or other incorrect data like this. And we can do even more in the future. We can check against external databases and flag differences for review. Or take sourcing. The moment someone adds a reliable source to a data point on Wikidata, it immediately becomes available for, to everyone. Now, granted, Wikidata does not have enough sources yet, but neither do most Wikipedias. With Wikidata, we have the chance to change this and raise the quality of our content across the board. Through all this, Wikidata is already allowing us today to give more people more access to more knowledge. But we can do so much more in the future. Have you ever tried finding a good image to illustrate a blog post, for example? Yes. I have two. I was looking for an image to illustrate friendship. So I started searching for friend, for Freund, the German word for friend. And I get back about 1,000 results. Most of them completely useless for me because they show people named Freund. OK, I go on and search for friend instead. I get back 14,000 results. That's much better. But the question is, how do I find the amazing ones? How do I find that one picture that really fits my blog post? Being the perfectionist I am, I went through them for hours and hours until I finally found, found the right one. And then I needed another fifth, two minutes and 15 clicks to put it into my blog, including proper attribution and everything. This is the state of Wikimedia Commons today. 
We can do so much better than this. With the help of Wikidata for Wikimedia Commons, we can make <coughs> we can make finding create multimedia content, no matter what language you speak, very easy. And we can build tools that allow you to reuse our content in a license compliant way and have that take less clicks, less time, and be less of a hassle. Now, being able to reuse multimedia content easily and finding it, no matter what language you speak, is already pretty cool, right? But we can do more. What if we had a powerful machine-readable dictionary? We could do automatic translations. And that's exactly what we will be able to do with Wikidata support for Wiktionary. Now, we're quite a bit away from actually doing this, but let me give you a glimpse into that future. Have a look at this delicious English restaurant menu. How about we switch it to German? Or Korean? This is already possible today, thanks to Wikidata, anywhere on the web. We can do even more. When people come to Wikipedia, they often have a very specific question, like, where was Charles Darwin born? With Wikidata, we are able to build the tools to be able to understand this question and formulate a meaningful answer. Now, we are quite some time away from being able to answer more complex questions. But again, let me give you a glimpse into that future. Where was Charles Darwin born? I assume you mean the British naturalist, author of On the Origin of Species, by means of natural selection, Charles Darwin was born in the Mount Shrewsbury. This... <laughs> this is already possible today, thanks to Wikidata. And in the coming months and years, we will be able to build so much more. To build all these innovative tools and to give more people more access to more knowledge, we need people like you to be a part of it. And so many of you are already on board. Take a guess how many people made an edit on Wikidata in the month of July? 10,000? Any other guesses? 400? OK. One more? One million. One million. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We're not quite there yet, but maybe next year. <laughs> 13,000. 13,000 people made an edit on Wikidata just in the month of July. And here are some of those amazing people. <laughs> I want to say thank you for your dedication, your commitment, and your courage to try new things. It's because of you that Wikidata is innovative, getting better every day, and steadily moving forward. To sum it up, over the last two years, we've built a central knowledge base that helps us to make the sum of all human knowledge machine-readable, widely accessible, and easily shareable. Our world was rather dark, and this is Wikidata today. I have a dream. Yes, Wikimedians, I have a dream. And my dream is that when we meet again in one year in Mexico City, that all of those maps I showed you, thanks to our continual work and with the help of Wikidata, will light up just like this one.
This will be a challenging but very important journey. Won't you join us? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Lydia will now be available for a Q&A in the foyer. Go around that way. And, uh, and we'll see you after the break at, um, at 11.30. Thank you.
Okay. Okay. Could it be the adapter which is broken? No, it's not. That's not. Uh, we. Uh, Hi. Hi. Is it actually working? I think I'm going to dance this talk because we do not have any image at the moment. Is this working? Sound check. One, two, three. Brilliant. Yep, just give us a couple of lines of sentences. Of course, of course. I'd love to give you a line or two. Please come on. This is a great session that is going to start very shortly.
Hello. Welcome back. Thank you for your patience while we sort out the, uh, the tech. Um, I am still Hannah Ballou. And I am going to introduce your next two speakers, and we'll have a, uh, a, a, a roundtable discussion. Um, first, we have Marcus Krusch. Marcus is a research group leader at T TU Dresden and an architectural advisor to the Wikidata project, which was strongly influenced by his project, Semantic Media Wiki. His research in information management and data access is closely related to his open source activities. He is an editor of the W3C Web Ontology Language, an author of several textbooks on semantic technologies, and co-creator of various open source projects, most recently the Wikimedia Foundation funded Wikidata Toolkit. His lecture today is entitled, How to Use Wikidata, Things to Make and Do with 30 Million Statements. Please welcome Marcus Krusch. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, welcome. Finally, we are uh, running 10 minutes late. I'm afraid this is a bit of my fault uh, here. Uh, as you can see, I had to change the topic of my talk. Uh, because when I submitted it, we had 13 million, now we have 40 million statements, things are growing. And of course, the question is even more pressing now, what are we actually going to do with it? Now, if you have seen Lydia's talk or read about Wikidata earlier, you actually certainly are convinced, I guess, that Wikidata is a great project, right? We have all kinds of knowledge in there. But the next question that people come up with usually is, what can I actually do with it? I mean, it's nice to have all these statements and these potential possibilities, but I think for many of us, it's not so clear how to really use such a resource, because it's the kind of resource also that many of us have not worked with before. We know other types of resources. So what I want to talk about here is uh, various things that you can do, and maybe also to inspire you a bit about other things that I might not even imagine that you want to do with that data. So what can you do with such data sets? Well, obviously, like with every wiki, you can read it. You can go to the web page and look up all the information that you want to look up. For example, if you uh, look at the page of London, this is what you are going to see. Um, yeah, London is the capital city of England. It has also some aliases. OK, other languages are shown here because I use C sometimes, or maybe not. Uh, and then there are a lot of statements. And the statements contain all this valuable information that you have heard about before. In fact, there are quite a number of them. And the page you can scroll down and read and be informed and, and uh, thrilled about what you know about London now. And then there will be other things like site links coming up. And somewhere at the very bottom of this page, there are even links to other projects in the Wikimedia space. So this is all great, isn't it? But of course, it's not necessarily what a user thinks of as a thrilling way to experience data. So the question is, oops, what else can we do? And one thing I think uh, which I call browse here is a slightly more um, visual, a slightly more user-friendly way of exploring this type of information. And one thing I can show you here is a very nice project uh, called Reason Nature, which is widely used now, which shows you exactly the same facts. They are all data, right? They are, you can view them in many ways. They are not hard-coded in text. You have to be creative on how to visualize them, and this is one way of doing that. Again, all what you see here is coming only from the boring long page I showed you in a, a minute ago. Um, but now we have the images embedded at the top. We have the boring properties moved to the side. We have geo information here. And well, it's still a long page. It still has a number of things on it, but it's a lot more approachable already. And it has some multimedia content like this timeline here about events that are related to London. So this is much better. And it's already used on many Wikipedias today when you have this Wikidata search enabled and you search for something that is not available in your language at all, you are offered to go to this page and to at least view the data that is known about this uh, entity. So this is browsing here, but of course you can do much more. And uh, this is more in the direction where we actually want to go. You can query for things, right? This is what we have used to motivate for a long time why we need Wikidata in the first place. Because we have so many things and we want to learn about them, uh, not one by one, but as a collection, as a whole, and we want to query and find information in this big haystack uh, of things. 
Um, one thing, for example, that we have here, Wikidata Query in general, is the main tool people use these days. This is one of the interfaces. It looks pretty technical. In fact, this is a query for all the animals on Wikidata. And the answer to that, you can see here, first animal is the human, and there are lions, and there are cats, and there are dinosaurs, and chickens. So it's pretty comprehensive, obviously. Uh, there are many more. You could go through result pages. You can see it here, 74 pages of results. But this is already a huge step forward. You can gather all the information, uh, all the items of a certain type with just one simple or maybe not so simple query that gives you access to this, rather than having to read through all the pages yourself to find the right information. But query is not the end of the use. It's rather the starting point of uh, advanced use of data that we want to see in the future. And one Next step that you can go into, and this is something that we have already seen this morning in the talks, is to display the data in creative ways. To not just query for a data set, but also to think about how to present it to user, how to uh, evoke new ideas, how to provoke insights by showing collections of data in ways that people haven't thought of before. Here you see something which is called the spatial, uh, tempo spatial display which shows a map of things, in this case, graves in uh, Père Lachaise uh, Cemetery in Paris, uh, together with a timeline of when uh, these graves were erected, I think actually when the people died, um, so, which may not even be the same in all cases. And you can browse this map and, and see a local area plan where the graves are, and at the same time, browse a timeline with information about this thing. So this is one thing you can do. Something completely different here, graph view of the data, um, where you have actually countries here and organizations that they belong to. And all the edges, they connect a country to an organization. In the middle, that's the United Nations. And then you have the European Union, the Commonwealth, and a number of other things. You could display many more, but at some point, obviously, graphs don't really work like that. And you have to, have to cut it off, or otherwise it will be too much information. Um, so that's a completely different way of displaying data, but again, we show a collection in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, another, whoops, another way of displaying data, uh, heat maps. Uh, this, uh, again, one of the brilliant tools Magnus Manske created uh, is showing heat maps of missing images in your area. So this is Greater London here, and you can see these are items which we know are located in this area, but which haven't an image associated. So you could go there now and try to fix that. Uh, and, uh, either take an image or just find one on Commons. And then we have here such a view, which is a very nice new timeline view that we will have another talk about called Histopedia. Uh, you can learn about this more in this conference, so I'm not going to talk much about it. But again, a completely different way of visualizing data. And again, all of this is coming from Wikidata and being shown in this new context, in this new way. So that's display. Um, but again, this is not where I think usage of data should end showing nice graphics of some subset of the data. You can do much more than that. You can actually go and take the whole data and start to analyze it and try to learn something from it. Uh, in fact, I don't know many instances where this has been done yet, and I think many more will follow, uh, but it's certainly something that one should think about right now already. So one example that I can give you is uh, something that Maximilian Klein did, uh, analyzing the sex ratios of uh, people on several Wikipedia projects. So you can do that, you know the sex or gender based on Wikidata properties, and you know whether the thing has an article in a Wikipedia in a certain language. So you can actually make a statistics of how, what the percentage of women is in a certain language Wikipedia, which is quite interesting. Uh, there are some methodological issues, one could discuss about that a lot, but uh, you can see interesting results here. And this is something that you only get by taking the whole data and aggregating it, summing it up, processing it, and thinking hard how to interpret the results as well. So that's not an obvious thing. So that's analysis. And I think from analysis, we can really gain a deeper understanding uh, of, the, of the information that we have there. So in fact, if you look at the uh, uh, different applications that I just showed you, it's really a kind of spectrum, starting from the most basic access of information, where we would say, 
basically it's just about knowing a certain fact, right? We just read it up. We look up for the birth date of the queen, for example, and then we know it, yes. But uh, as we advance here, we come increasingly to a level of understanding where we actually gain insights that we didn't have before. And I think this is what we need to do. This is why we have data. It's not just about looking up facts. You can use Google for that, right? And you can use Wikipedia, which is doing an amazing job for that as well. Now, unfortunately, if you look into practice, most things that happen these days are on the far left of this screen here. Um, people like to read. People think in terms of questions they can answer easily on Google. It's hard for normal people to even come up with difficult questions sometimes. And uh, the more you move to this side, as I said, analysis has not been done very much. Display is just exploding. There are so many new things coming up there, but it's still far from being really exploited to the full. And um, most of the things still happen in these more traditional areas. So for this talk, I would like to focus really more on the vision part and uh, the site where we are trying to understand data as a whole rather than just as an isolated collection of facts. If you take an example, if you have any particular fact, it's usually informative, yes, but it's not very interesting. You may know that there were 7,574 7, births somewhere. But the information only becomes really meaningful if you put this into context and compare it to a world of information that is around it and that uh, relates it and gives it perspective. In this case, for example, this is where people on Wikidata are born. Darker colors are more people in this case, and what you see here are about 1.2 million entries. Uh, on the map. In fact, this is all interactive. I don't have time here for a live demo, but this is not pre-rendered or anything. This is JavaScript. You can zoom in and out. Uh, it's quite an amazing, uh, interesting application. Okay, so how do we actually create such applications? That's a big question, right? We have this huge data set, and I showed you some examples, but how can you come up with your own? How, where to start? And I think uh, one thing we have to start at is to ask the question, what's actually in there? We like to think of ourselves as providing the sum of all knowledge, but of course we know that we have certain focal points. We have things which we have more expertise on and things where other sources might be better suited. And so it's very important to start with understanding these. So far we have 15.7 million items, roughly, um, which basically you could view as articles, right? It's a lot more than English Wikipedia has, and indeed much of this content is not found on English Wikipedia yet. Um, but what are they actually? What do you think? Right? For example, how many people do we have among these 16 million? 100,000? Millions? 10 million? What? Sorry? <laughs> we don't know. That's a, that's a wise answer from somebody who knows. Uh, so <laughs> I will talk more about how I actually count, that, but it's a very good, good point, of course. It's sometimes even hard to know what we know. Uh, so there are the known knowns and the known unknowns, you know all that. Okay, um, but anyway, uh, in one way of reckoning, I can count about 2.4 million people, which isn't an accurate number maybe, but it tells us something about a bias we have. We definitely are very interested in people. That's something that Wikipedia is strong at. And, uh, but we also have other topics, for example, Species, I was surprised. I mean, I know that there are a lot of species on Wikidata and on Wikipedia in general, but I was surprised to see the actual number. 1.6 million species. I mean, name 10. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge for people not in biology to appreciate where all these species are coming from. And I have no idea how much there are in total that we could have. Stars. How many stars do we have? That's, I have two numbers here. This is film stars. This is plasma spheres. So, well, see a bit of a bias again. Uh, if, if, which occurs naturally, but I, I mean, 8,000 stars in space, uh, again, I would have a hard time naming five. Um, lighthouses, let's go for something completely uh, specific to a certain field. We also have information on that. We actually have 1,700 lighthouses in the world documented on Wikidata. And when you see these numbers, the obvious questions you need to ask is, uh, how complete is that data? So how well are we doing in each of these categories? Can we already use this, or is that something that is not really ready for prime time? And uh, 
if you do query answering, actually this is not a big problem because people just want to see the 10 best results and maybe they browse through, through 100, but they never look at all the 1 million results. So it doesn't really matter if you have some obscure star missing at the end of your list. But if you do um, data analysis, of course, this can become quite a big problem because uh, at this point you really want to have an overview of all the data. You want to compute the average number of children people have or something. And of course, if there are children missing or if people are missing, then this will be a wrong number. It will just not be meaningful. And so for data analysis, it seems to be that there is a big issue with these ideas that we have here working in a wiki-based system. Uh, where everything naturally always has to be incomplete, right? Um, so this could be perceived as a big weakness of the whole approach, data analysis as not being meaningful on incomplete data. But I would rather like to turn this into a strength, saying that data analysis actually can reveal incompleteness in data where we are not aware of it yet. Because you don't see something missing when you just look at the most prominent 10 results. You have to see the aggregate. You have to see all of it and then notice that some things are suspiciously white spots on your map, for example, and that something has to be done there. So this is why I also want to advocate here for going more into the understanding direction, not just for gaining external insights, but also for understanding our own system and improving our own quality here. And Lydia has talked about this a bit in her talk already. Um, now, how to understand Wikidata? Again, I think at this point, to really understand it, we do need to talk about ontology at some point. Uh, ontology being, well, often defined in, in, in academic literature as a shared conceptualization of a domain of interest. In other words, it's just what people agree on that the world roughly looks like. It's not the facts, it's the shape of the facts. So it's not that we agree on all the details, it's agreeing on how we actually represent the details uh, in the system. And this happens everywhere. If you are in databases, you have to have a schema first before you actually enter any data. And on Wikidata, it's not so much the schema of the database, this is fixed, but users have a great freedom to actually add um, vocabulary elements. They can choose what kind of properties they want to talk about, whether they want to have birth dates and populations or something entirely different maybe that is more relevant to lighthouses, for example. And so in Wikidata context, uh, we mainly have to talk about properties and classes uh, here. Now, properties I guess many have some basic idea what it means, uh, because we have seen a lot of examples. I mentioned birth dates, I mentioned uh, parent of a person, the location of a lighthouse. All of these things are properties which have a certain value for a certain thing. And on Wikidata, people add these properties in order to describe things as they go along. But here I would also like to talk about classes a bit, which we use a lot on Wikidata that are not a technical construct, but something that the user community, the uh, people who make the content, actually have come up with in order to understand, to structure the data. So what's a class? Well, first of all, we have roughly 40,000 of them, which is already quite a lot. Um, it's not so easy to count because there's no crisp definition of what a class exactly is. Intuitively speaking, a class is something that describes the type of a, an entity, a lighthouse, for example. Things can be a lighthouse, or things can be a human, or a certain automobile, or they can be a star. So these are very different things, and we somehow want to capture this nature of the thing as such. And for this, we use classes. And to just give you a little example, I have found here this uh, little pink unicorn, as it turns out, which seems to be notable, at least on Italian Wikipedia, called Twilight Sparkle. And it is, I don't know about it much, but I can find from Wikidata that it is an instance of a unicorn. So I know what it kind of, what basic thing it is. And we use that very much to actually understand the information. So for example, if I want to count how many lighthouses there are, this is the approach I'm taking. Instance of is really important. And then what people can also do is they can further organize the classes using subclass of. Basically, for example, unicorn is a subclass of mythical creature, which means every unicorn is also a mythical creature. In particular, Twilight Sparkle is a mythical creature. So this is, these are two things that are very heavily used on Wikidata to organize content. And it's not always clear-cut what is a class and what is an instance here. For example, uh, unicorn is also an instance of something, namely of fictional taxon. If you don't know what taxon is, think species. Um, so it's a fictional species 
And of course, it's, n it's true that unicorn is a fictional species. It's not true that twilight sparkle is a fictional species. So it would be wrong to say subclass off here. It's an instance. And this is the type of modeling that's going on. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of discussion in the community how to exactly do that and what to, what to, uh, how to approach these problems. At the same time, you have a lot less properties than these 40,000 classes, only 1,100 roughly. And um, these properties are introduced in a much more thorough and careful community process, and a lot of discussion is done. But still, there are a lot. And for example, if I'm interested in lighthouses, it's very e hard to find out where the lighthouses actually are coming from, or what kind of properties I should use on them. Um, here I tried to make a little tech cloud about the properties that are most used. So these are these 1,200 properties by ranked by how often they are used. And you can see instance of is predominant in this space. And some other things appear here which are related to species or related to people or related to places. But most of those 1,000 properties are actually hard to see on this tech cloud at all. If you apply a logarithmic scale to the tech cloud, it looks a bit more realistic. Now, small size differences are showing huge differences in usage. And you can see many more properties coming up here. And you can imagine it's quite difficult to, to find your way around in this jungle. So instance office is still here, but many other things come into view. And, and suddenly, so somehow we have to navigate that. So when we want to understand Wikidata, it's really the question, what's, what's in there? And also the question, which properties are in there? What information is even recorded, not just how complete is it? And in order to facilitate that, a little project we have done is the Wikidata Classes and Properties Browser, for example, which shows you all the classes and properties. And here in this view, for example, I have filtered out the classes which have at least 1,000 instances. And I find this an amazing view because it actually gives you a feeling of what we care about in Wikidata, at least in a certain uh, interpretation of care. Uh, so. It, all of these fit on one single result page. There are less than 200 classes here, and you can actually scroll through them and see these are the things we actually have. These are the elements, and somewhere down here is also Lighthouse uh, between Cemetery and Magazine and Website and Airline. So, uh, but you can get a kind of feeling what kind of things we, we, we are working with. And when you click on this in the browser, you will also see typical properties that these lighthouses use. So this is all automatically generated, uh, finding that there are properties like light characteristic of a lighthouse, source of energy, the coordinate location, of course, the floors above ground, and many other things that are perfectly sensible to use on a lighthouse, but which you may not have known even existed if you wouldn't have such kind of a tool somewhere. And um, by the way, all the tools I'm showing here, I will have links on the talk page later on for this talk, not on the talk page, but on the wiki page of the talk. Uh, in case you are interested. So now I know that I, being a developer, go to my Java program. I say, OK, I want to have a view of lighthouses with several properties that I find interesting. I run it. It takes about five minutes in my case, because it has to load everything from disk first. And then here I am with my nice visual browser of lighthouses around the world. And I can filter uh, by lighthouses for countries, for example. So if I want to see the lighthouses here in the UK, I have this little map based on Wikidata data. So this is something I can do once I understand that there are lighthouses and what properties are actually interesting about lighthouses. And I can see that there are gaps here. There are certainly some lighthouses here that should be around. And um, I could use this even to improve the data. Now, why am, you, why am I actually showing you this? So do I want to advertise my website of lighthouses for everyone? No. Or do I want to show off how, how easy it is for me to make a nice browsing? No. Uh, the idea really at this whole uh, process is to emphasize that it's usually not hard to realize an idea. There is a lot of great technology around. The browser I've used here, I have not programmed myself. This is MEGA uh, browser done by Yaron Koren. It's very simple to, to use. You just use a CSV file as an input, and it makes this nice, facile browsing. What you need to know, however, is what you actually want to show. You need to know what the data is you are interested in, and you have to have an idea, a vision, so to speak, what kind of 
service you want to provide on this. And I think this is really what we need to develop. I mean, I'm talking to you here not as users. We are not users. We are makers, right? We are the people who make the applications that other people will use. And we define what they think of when they hear query or visualization and data. Maybe today they tell you, oh, that's what I can do in Google. Maybe in a year they will tell you something completely different based on a tool that you have just come up with and will be developing by then. So, I cannot give you a recipe on how to actually make the Wikidata application, simply because I don't know even how it would look, and there are so many options for you to take, and they will have technical ramifications, of course. But I can give you a bit of a starting point, at least. So, you got an idea, or maybe you will develop one in the uh, conference here. Uh, how do you get started? What can you do? And I think one basic decision that you have to make or one thing you have to think about at some point is where do you actually get this data? I mean, you know there's wikidata.org and there are pages, but that's not how you can actually make such a browser of lighthouses. So what are you going to do in order to, to make this work? And um, here's basically a decision tree for what are your choices there. Basically, there are two ways of getting the data at the moment. One is to use a web API, the other is to use data exports. Web API means you have live uh, results directly from a website delivered to you, usually in some JavaScript or JSON uh, format, and you can use it as a very lightweight way to obtain data. Query one particular thing, get one particular result. Data exports mean you have all of the data available at your fingertips. You can do heavyweight processing if it, you can uh, load it into a database to do more advanced queries, and you can do analysis like the ones that Max Klein did with the sex ratios, for example. So this may, depends on your application, I would say. Now, on the web API side, you have a lot of data already directly being available from Wikidata as such. So it has a very good API. It can Basically, everything you can do as a user can be done through the API, and many people use this already. You have seen this translation of the restaurant menu example in uh, Lydia's talk. This is one thing you can directly do live through the API, web page translation uh, in this particular way. If you want to use it, there are a lot of MediaWiki bot tools that help you to access the API of MediaWiki. On the other hand, there are also great third-party services that you can use to query data. In particular, I want to highlight here Wikidata Query, which is used by many projects to get query access to the data. On the other hand, if you go for the data exports, you can use database dumps, which are provided like for all the Wikimedia projects in a regular interval. There are some more formats even in this case. And you can download these whole files, usually some three gigabytes in size, and process the content. And uh, to make that quicker and easier for you, we have developed Wikidata Toolkit, which is a Java library that allows you to do this type of processing. And recently, we also provide RDF dumps for those of you who prefer to use this type of format to get to your knowledge. OK, and finally, of course, uh, maybe even before you think about how to get data and how to realize anything, talk to people. I mean, that's why you're here after all. You will find a lot of expertise all through this conference, people in Wikidata t-shirts everywhere. Uh, approach them, come up with your ideas, uh, engage them in your fascinating plan of how to make the world a different place, and find some developers maybe even who can help you technically uh, to realize this. Uh, so basically, this is how I want to end my talk. You are here, and uh, hopefully, at some point, we will have a world coming together where all this data is available in many more ways than I just have shown you. And uh, many thanks to these people in particular who have provided things for this talk. Thank you very much for listening. Hi. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, while we're, while we're getting mics switched up and, uh, and computers um, changed over and whatnot, I'd like to, I just, I'll, I'd like to apologize to um, all of the children at home watching the live stream who are, who've just were crushed by Marcus's revelation that unicorns are not real. <laughs> that, was, um, that was harsh. Um, I'll also, I'll tell you about our next speaker, uh, Victor Meyer Schoenberger is the co-author of the international bestseller, Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think. He's also the author of Delete, 
the virtue of forgetting in the digital age, which won the 2010 Marshall McLuhan Award for Outstanding Book, and the 2010 Don Kay Price Award for Best Book in Science and Technology Politics. Uh, Victor has published over 100 articles and book chapters. He is the Oxford Internet Institute's Professor of Internet Governance and Regulation, and he spent 10 years on the faculty of Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. And today, he's going to speak to you, to speak to you about how data is changing the world. Um, are we still, still working things out? Okay. All right. Very good. All right, please join me in welcoming Victor yep. Maya Schoenberger. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Can't believe we all did that, uh, Hannah, in about 30 seconds or so. Thank you, Connie. Um, I have about uh, 28 minutes and some to talk about big data and what it is, particularly to an audience like you. Now, you are very familiar, you're intimately familiar with Wikipedia. In fact, I want to congratulate you. Uh, you have been at the forefront of uh, a movement that made knowledge accessible throughout the world. And if I, if I go back and remember how I started off some, boy, 30 odd years ago, going to school, my dad, I grew up in rural Austria, my dad, my dad once came home and he said, I did something crazy. I bought us an encyclopedia. And we would spend evenings and evenings looking at the encyclopedia that he had bought. And for me, it was like a door to the world. But most of my classmates at that time in rural Austria didn't have the encyclopedia, so they would come to our house to check it out. Now, thanks to your work, there is knowledge accessible throughout the world. And when I now encounter my students, everybody is always looking up everything on Wikipedia. So that is great. You have made accessible the world's knowledge. But I'm here to tell you today that that is not enough. That in fact, what you have done is just approached the tip of the iceberg. There is a huge iceberg beneath it. A huge amount that needs to still be done. A green field like you have seen never before. as the green field of data. For millennia, we have gathered data and we have examined it. It's nothing new to us human beings. That's the way we have tried to understand the world around us for eons. But collecting and analyzing data was costly and was time consuming. And so we often aim to gather as little as possible for the purpose that we had in mind. It was the age of small data, in which our methods, in which our processes, in which our institutions that we built to make sense of data were shaped by the dearth of it and the difficulties and cost of obtaining it. We developed, for example, a hundred years ago, a little less than a hundred years ago, randomized sampling to squeeze lots of insights out of small amounts of data. It was a tremendous achievement and a great step forward, enabling everything from better forecasting to improved quality control. But it was essentially a shortcut, a way of understanding reality by capturing just a small portion of it. It was the intellectual outgrowth of small data thinking in which the cost of data collection and analysis shaped how we made sense of the world around us. Now, what if that changes? 
What if collecting data is no longer so resource intense, so time consuming and so costly that we have to settle for samples? What if collecting data could be cheap and so could analyzing it? What does that do to how we understand reality, to the scientific method, to human understanding? We'll soon find out because the economics of data are rapidly changing. It arguably began with the natural sciences maybe two decades ago. Consider astronomy. When the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that's a telescope, came online in 2000, the telescope gathered more data in its first few weeks than had been amassed in the entire history of astronomy. Over the past years, it collected over 200 terabytes of astronomy data. But a successor telescope, here you see a rendering, due to come on stream in 2016, will acquire that amount of quantity of astronomy data every five days. What does that do at scale? You've probably heard of the tremendous increase in the data that we have. Um, in 2007, it was supposed to be 300 billion gigabytes of data in the world. That was a hundredfold increase from just 20 years earlier. A hundred xing um, over 20 years. What does that mean? How can we put that in perspective? Well, if we go back in human history, Elizabeth Eisenstein maintains that the last time the amount of data increased so dramatically over a short period of time was between 1450 and 1503. Where in 53 years or so, the amount of data, thanks to Gutenberg's printing revolution, doubled. Here we have a 100x increase in 20 years, but that is only half the story. The other half, of course, is denoted by the different colors here on this graph, and you see it immediately. In the year 2000, that is that right-hand vertical white bar. In the year 2000, three-quarters of the data in the world was still analog. Three-quarters. Today, it's less than 1%. So within 15 years, we have moved from an almost entirely analog world into a digital world. Why is this so important? It is so important because the quantity, if we have so much of it, translates into a new quality. Think of photography. If I take a picture of a horse and a rider on top of it, that's just a picture. If I take a picture every minute, that's just pictures. If I take a picture 16 times a second and show them in fast succession, that is, if I dramatically increase the quantity, I create a new quality. And that is precisely the promise of big data. Three qualities encapsulate what big data could be, more messy and correlations. Let me step through these three very briefly. First, more. More means that we can collect far more data and analyze it about a particular problem or a phenomenon or a question we have relative to something than ever before when we were limited mostly to just using small sample sizes. That way we can let the data speak and that often reveals insights that we never would have thought of before. Let me try and explain again how we can, how we can understand what this entails and means. Think about photography again, right? If I, if I were to take a photograph of you, as I do, I would have to make a choice right now, as I am, on who to focus. And if I focus on the nice lady here in the front rows, then unfortunately you, sir, with the blue t-shirt in the back there and the cool glasses, you're going to be out of focus. Sorry. Too bad. I have to make a choice. At the point of taking the photograph, that is at the point of collecting the data, I need to choose what is important to me and what isn't. Because I can't capture all of it in my standard photograph. 
So here is a photograph of my four-year-old son. In the front, you have a toothbrush. The toothbrush is in focus. My son is out of focus. After I've taken the photo, I can't go back and put my son back into focus. I can't go into, zoom in, do analysis there, because the data is not there. The detail is not there. Or is it? Turns out this is not an ordinary photograph. This actually is a big data photograph shoot, shot with this camera, a light through a light field camera, that captures not just one focal pane, but lots of focal pane. So I can click on my son, and he gets into focus. Because I have captured all the data. And I can click on the toothbrush, and the toothbrush comes into focus. Why is this important? It is important because that is precisely what big data, if we have close to all of the data about a phenomenon available, can do. I can, after the fact, ask questions that I didn't even think of asking when I collected the data. I can let the data speak to me because I have captured almost all of the phenomenon in data. That is the quantum leap if we go for n equals all or close to it. The second quality is an embrace of messiness. So, if we think about the age of small data, in the age of small data where we could collect data only at great cost, we tried to collect as little as possible at the highest possible quality. If you only have 10 data points, you better get all of them right. If you have 3 billion data points, getting a thousand of them not perfectly accurate is not so dramatic. We begin to understand that there is a trade-off, a trade-off between the quality of data points and the quantity of data points. And we need to decide for ourselves where we spend the resources that we have by either collecting more or by collecting something at higher quality. We don't give up on exactitude entirely here in the big data which We only give up our singular devotion to exactitude. And that gives, gives us uh, additional insight at the macro level. More and messy taken together help us in a third quality of big data that's called, or that I can refer to as correlations. Correlations, of course, you are very familiar with, basically seeming connections in data. Correlations are no causality. You've heard that in the entry-level class of statistics over and over again. The problem is our brain doesn't get it. The problem is that we human beings are hardwired, as Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman writes so eloquently in Thinking Fast and Slow, hardwired to see the world as a sequence, as a series of causes and effects. If I had come to London yesterday evening and gone to a new restaurant here in London, and today I would feel sick, my brain would immediately have connected the new restaurant and my sickness today in a cause and effect linkage. Even though it is far more likely that I would have gotten the stomach by shaking hands with any one of you. But our brain wants to create causal linkages even where they don't exist. Why? Because it makes us feel comfortable. It gives us the illusion of understanding the world as it is, even though we don't. So rather than believing in these quick causal insights, big data could help us understand what is going on before we venture to find out why things are going on. We learn, in other words, to walk before we learn to run. This has already been applied in a particularly interesting area, namely in machine translation. In the 1950s, 
um, the Pentagon had intercepted lots and lots of Russian documents. See, Snowden wasn't so novel. And with these tens of thousands of pages of Cyrillic writing, they needed people to translate it into English. But they didn't have enough translators. Some things never change. So they went around and asked people, experts, for help. Computer scientists volunteered, and they said, uh, making two mistakes that computer scientists normally make, A, they vastly overestimate their abilities and vastly underestimate the time it takes to complete a task. They said, oh, that's not a problem. Within three months, we have a software that will translate Russian into English because we will teach our computer the 300 grammatical rules and we add a little dictionary to it and we're done. Ten years later and about a billion dollars spent in today's terms, the project was declared a failure. Pentagon wrote it off like so many other things and there we go. Nothing happened until the end of the 1980s when brilliant engineers at IBM had an idea. Why not approach machine translation, leaving causality behind, leaving the why behind? Why not approach machine translation purely from statistics with no rules taught to the computer? So what did they do? They said, we'll try to find out what word in one language is most statistically speaking, most frequently translated in what word in another language given a particular word context. In order to train our system, they used three million sentences neatly translated from English into French and, back and, and vice versa, uh, namely the parliamentary protocols of the Canadian Parliament bilingual. The result was Project Candide that was first machine translation successful. Then the IBM engineer said, yes, success. Now our next step is to improve the algorithm. They worked for three years, no fundamental improvement. They gave up. Ten years later, Franz Ox at a small startup company called Google looked at it and said, they didn't get it. It's not the algorithm that was not helping them. It is the lack of data. And so he said, I'm going to feed into my machine translation project the entire World Wide Web. Every web page of the European Union in 20-odd languages, finally they're good for something. Uh, we're feeding in all of these uh, corporate websites in multiple languages. We're feeding in all of those manuals of, of vacuum cleaners and typewriters, no, routers and VCRs and washing machines. You know, when I read this and when we spoke with Franz Ox, we were like, you must be kidding. If I read my VCR manual, you know, I can't even understand English. And you were feeding that in, trying to learn to teach your system machine translation. And he said, yeah, if you have 100,000 times more than 3 million sentences, if you have such a huge amount, a little bit of messiness doesn't matter. The result is Google Translate. More messy correlations. Machine translation has no clue why one word is translated into another word. It's just a statistical correlation, not more than that. Now, if you think now that this is too far removed and too concentrated on internet companies, think again. Let's talk about some very vulnerable human being, premature babies. The researchers at the University Hospital in Toronto around Dr. Carolyn McGregor, who looked at premature babies. And premature babies are particularly vulnerable to infections. And so you want to discover an infection as early as possible. But when you see the first symptoms manifest themselves, it's often too late. So can you do better? And Dr. Carolyn McGregor said, yes. What did they do? Big data approach. Digital sensors that measured the vital signs of the baby to the tune of 1,200 data points a second. Capture that over hours and days and weeks, over dozens and dozens of babies, and then 
try to find a pattern in the data that most likely predicts the future onset, the later onset of an infection. And they were able to find that pattern. They can now, with a great degree of likelihood, predict that a baby will have an infection 24 hours before the first symptoms manifest themselves, just by looking at the slightly changes in the vital signs. And Dr. Carolyn McGregor said, one of the telltale signs that the baby is in grave danger in the future is if the vital signs suddenly stabilize. Now, what kind of pediatrician would have ever thought that? Every pediatrician that I know of says, oh, well, the vital signs stabilize, I go home for the day. But this, with premature babies, actually is a, one of the telltale signs of a likely oncoming infection. Again, it is more messy in correlation. The data was much more than we typically processed before in such situations. The data was so vast that it wasn't at all in clean form. It was messy. And the findings were correlations. Dr. Carolyn McGregor does not know why the baby is likely to have an infection. But knowing that it is going to have an infection is a very important and valuable first step because you can give medication. And that saves lives. Very important lives. In essence, therefore, if we approach big data that way, big data can give us a new perspective on reality. Reality in how we didn't capture it before. So far, we had to go for small data, for simplifications, for shortcuts, for generalizations and abstractions, because we could not capture the world in all of its complexity, in all of its difficulty. But with big data, we can develop this humility vis-a-vis -a, -vis a complex reality. We can become humble again by looking at reality and saying, oh, Newton's gravitational law does not completely capture all of that. Of course, Newton's law of gravity is a shortcut. And it took Albert Einstein to find out that we actually need to amend it in order to capture relativity and space-time. We didn't need Einsteinian's law of gravity until we developed GPS satellites. But for GPS, we know we need them. And that means that we understand that reality is much more complex than we thought. The value of all of this data lies not in the purpose for which the data was collected at the first place, but the value lies in reusing the data and reusing the data and reusing the data. The value lies in the reuse of the data. Think about this. Lufthansa, German Airlines, um, has about 300 aircraft or so uh, in the air every single day. Uh, lots of sensors on the aircraft capture temperature information and humidity uh, and other weather data during flight to send to the flight management and autopilot system. That's great, and then the data is thrown away. A few years ago, Lufthansa started to capture it essentially on something like a thumb drive. And then once the plane lands, they take the data that the airplane encountered, the weather data, and send it to the German Weather Service. That alone has improved German weather forecasts by 7 to 8 percent. Or to use another reuse of data, a mobile phone operator in the Netherlands discovered that the signal strengths of the cell towers change depending on the local weather at the local cell tower. So they realized they have 10,000 real-time weather stations out there that give them weather data all the time. And they are now thinking about going into the weather business. Probably much more profitable than being in a commodity business like mobile phones. A startup project at MIT is going out and capturing all these price data from Amazon and eBay and, and, and all of the other e-commerce sites 
to the tune of a billion prices a day. What do they do with it? They analyze it. They are reusing that existing data out there that was put out for a different purpose, and they're able to predict inflation rates far faster, almost in real time, compared to the government, um, uh, uh, the official government numbers. Or take uh, NHS data here in Britain that then was analyzed by an open data collective that revealed different prescription cultures and different prescription behaviors uh, throughout Britain uh, between expensive branded statins and inexpensive generic ones. Uh, with this analysis, the NHS believes that it can save about 100 million pounds a year just by looking at the data and, 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 and helping inform people that is inform doctors about the use. Now, if the value is in the reuse of the data that we have, what do we need? We need the expertise and we need the tools. We need the mindset and we need the data. Now, a lot of people, a lot of consultants run around now and say, what we are missing most is the expertise and the tools. Not in the long term, because as most of my students discover, this is very lucrative to be in the big data business. So they move into these professions. The mindset, too, is developing. But what we miss is the data. Or more precisely, the access to the data. Because data oftentimes is stovepipe. Data is held by large commercial entities, by government bureaucracies, and so forth. So in order to reap the value of the data, not just for commercial purposes, but much more profoundly for societal purposes, for giving us human beings a better sense of reality, we need to improve the access to that data. And there is a global movement that you all are familiar with about open data and opening up that data, particularly data that is being held by the government. That is great, but that means that data is dispersed uh, in many different instances. This is where Wikidata comes in as a one-stop shop for data access, and it's a fabulous idea. It's a fabulous idea because there we can go and there we can find the data sources that we need. So I must applaud full-heartedly the Wikidata project because that is trying to get to the great insights that data can provide us. But there's a problem. There's a big problem. You all have been very successful with Wikipedia. But in a crucial aspect, Wikidata is not like Wikipedia. Wikipedia presents the world's knowledge, but Wikipedia's output is in an immediately comprehensible format for human beings. We do not need any additional intermediaries to acquire knowledge through Wikipedia. We just need to read it. In fact, this is one of Wikipedia's core strengths. With Wikidata, however, the situation is more difficult. Data, especially huge amounts of data, are not immediately comprehensible for us humans, and the insights gleaned from the data regularly require intermediaries to act, to analyze the data, and to make sense of it. So unlike with Wikipedia, where one could credibly proclaim, let us build it and they will come, this does not work equally well with data. In fact, in the United States, 500,000 data sets were made available and accessible by the federal government. But only a tiny fraction of those 500,000 data sets or so have actually been used in open data applications. So even access to data is not enough because something is missing. It's not like we build it and day will come. 
we at the Oxford Internet Institute did some research and we have some very, very preliminary results about the, the universe of open data developers. And it usually is just like a data source, a developer, a data source, a developer. There is no connection, there is no fabric, there is no community to think of. So what we need to think of when we think about the importance of data is that we need for open data applications an ecosystem that enables development, that facilitates that these intermediaries actually come in and do something with the data. That is the core challenge going forward. We at the OII are, are trying to build a directory of open data applications, and so I'd like to make a bet here. Here is my Twitter handle, and the first three people who send me five open data apps that we don't have in our database already will get a free and autographed copy of my big data book. So let me finish. The world and understanding the world means comprehending an iceberg. We have made great progress getting access to what is above the water level. But there is so much below. That is the data. Making it accessible is an important and necessary first step. But it is not sufficient. We need more than that. We need the access to the data, and then we need to think about how to incentivize that many of us, and many, 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 many more, go out and do something with the data so that we as a society can benefit from it. That is the task that lies ahead of us. It's a huge greenfield, and you're invited to join the effort. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Victor. Um, we are about to start the Open Data Roundtable panel, so if the panel members could make their way to the stage now, that would be wonderful. Uh, it's, it's hosted by Jemima Kish of The Guardian, and I'll just let you take a, a very brief leg stretch break while, while we get set up here on stage and hand it over to Jemima. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. 
My name is Jemima week, Pish, and I'm the head of technology yeah. at The Guardian, which is on the editorial side. I don't fix servers. Or any, well, not yet. Um, uh, so we have a real rock star panel for you, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves um, in 30 seconds, which is a challenge for anybody, um, but particularly for these people <coughs> with the huge breadth of experience and expertise they have between them. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say um, that we should all <coughs> congratulate the volunteers that have put this event together. I've been to... <laughs> quite much. I've been to plenty of corporate conferences that have been nowhere near as organised or well-planned as this one, so well done, everybody. Um, and welcome to London, those of you that have come a very long way. Thank you very much. Um, it was interesting that uh, Victor, in his talk just now, touched on how lucrative big data is for jobs. Um, I know at The Guardian we've had a small number but, um, of data journalists, but they're very, very highly regarded. And also finding somebody that has an understanding of editorial, um, of editorial and of data and its potential is very difficult and there is huge potential for jobs even in that kind of niche around data. Um, so it's a very exciting area, especially if you're looking to develop a career. So on to our superstar panel. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'd like you in, in 30 seconds to say who you are where you work, and then also describe what's the challenge around data that you're trying to crack, that you have to tackle every day. Let's start at the end with Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Marincola, I'm Chief Executive Officer of the Public Library of Science, the largest uh, open access scientific publisher. We're based in San Francisco. Uh, our concern about data has to do with making it available in the same way that the narrative of a scientific article is available. Uh, and not just available, but uh, mineable, searchable, and usable for, uh, for scientists throughout the world. So that's my 30 seconds. Perfect. Rufus. Hi, uh, everybody. Um, I'm Rufus Pollock from Open Knowledge. Uh, open Knowledge is a, a global network which has been working since 2004 to open up information and uh, make it freely available uh, to anyone to do anything they like with it. Um, and also to see that information actually turns into useful, if you like, knowledge uh, that actually empowers citizens and organizations to answer questions that matter and drive positive change. Because sadly, data on its own doesn't, doesn't often lead to the insights or the change we like to see. It has to, has to be acted on, it has to be analyzed, and so on. Um, I think the change that we're looking to see most fundamentally is that in this incredible age that we're entering, where everything that glitters will be bits, um, there's a kind of fight for the soul of that information age, it, it, if you like. It could be an age based on either exploitation, if you like, in which this incredible information we have is used and mined to kind of analyze and predict and, and manipulate us, or to empower us. It's an age that can be built on collaboration, or it could be built around control, or it could be built around sharing. Um, or, um, or exclusion. And for us, obviously, the former of each of those options is the world, the information age we'd like to see. Perfect. Lydia. Hello. I'm Lydia Pinche. I'm the product manager for Wikidata uh, at Wikimedia Germany. And the one thing that is very important for me is that we get from this mindset of consuming open data to actually being able to edit it, to play with it, and so on. Hi, my name is Markus Krutsch. I am a uh, research group leader at uh, the Technical University of Dresden. I have been in academic research for many years, um, researching intelligent information systems in all their facets, often on the discrete side of things, so less correlations, more inferences and query answering. Um, I think this is also a very important aspect of data that we have to take into account when you look at large projects like the knowledge graph projects of all major search engines or Facebook these days, um, that we have large uh, discrete structures, large databases that we want to create, which are again different from the scientific gathered open data that we find in other disciplines. And I think we have to understand this whole spectrum of open data to really be able to use it. Richard. Uh, Richard Sterling from the International Director at the Open Data Institute. The big challenge uh, for me is uh, 
tr to going from open data to impact uh, in a number of countries around the world, be they developing countries or developed countries? Uh, Peter Murray Rust from Cambridge Open Knowledge and Content Mine. Um, I actually uh, wrote or started the Wikipedia entry on open data. In 2006, the words did not exist. Uh, my biggest problem is that huge corporations want to own data and are currently spending billions of dollars on stopping us having access, and I want us to free it. Victor Meyer Schoenberg, I just spoke, and my biggest hurdle, or the biggest challenge that I see is um, that we humans tend to dislike data. <laughs> uh, Nigel Chabot, um, I'm a professor of artificial intelligence at Southampton University and also chairman and co-founder of the Open Data Institute. I spoke earlier on this morning um, about the challenge that I see around understanding how systems at the scale of Wikipedia work at all. Uh, but my interest in open data is ensuring, I helped uh, initiate the UK program uh, back in 2009 with uh, some of the members on, on, on this panel. The challenge in open data is keeping governments true to their uh, promise of making this stuff available. The data that matters, not just the data that's easy to release, and then exporting that idea to the commercial sector and trying to explain to people that there is more value in their data being widely used than being hoarded. Perfect. I think we could probably talk for about a week on all of those issues, but we will try to keep it to 60 minutes and a bit less. Um, so th this is a round table, so I'm not going to do the boring thing of putting a question and then everyone on the panel answers it. I'm going to throw points your way and you're going to jump in and answer them. Um, so, first off, just to, to look at the last 12 months since the last Wikimania, can you come up with some, some really interesting examples of progress or new challenges or big issues that have come up in the last 12 months? What, what's happened that's good? Let's start with that. I'll give you one example. Uh, despite I just said you've got to keep a constant eye on government living up to its promises, um, one part of the UK government made a big shift. Companies House now releases all of its data as open data, openly licensed, which is a big shift. Knowing all the entities in your country that are legal companies um, is quite an important part of any data infrastructure, and we would do well to have that model around the world. Um, Peter, you said that there are commercial entities that are, are you know, trying to get hold of data and, and lock it away. What significant has well, happened this year? Well, uh, I'm going to show later uh, that we spend uh, worldwide half a trillion dollars on scientific, technical and medical research. 80% of that is wasted uh, and uh, much of the rest is sold rather than being available to us. Um, I think the biggest thing I have heard this year is Wikidata. And I am absolutely blown away by the idea, uh, and I've said today that Wikidata is the future of science data. And Elizabeth. Uh, parochially speaking, uh, PLOS uh, implemented a uh, data policy this year, uh, which in March, which requires that every author who submits a paper must provide uh, uh, access to the data that contributed to the findings of the paper being considered for publication, uh, preferably as a deposit with a DOI or an accession number into a field-specific repository. Uh, if necessary, we'll post the data ourselves, but in some way, the author must make the data available for the paper even to be considered for publication. Okay, anything um, else significant? Yes, Rufus? Yeah, I think there are two, I think there are two things. I think you could give a couple of examples. Um, one, actually, to complement the company's house, we also got a lot of data from the land registry in the UK. But that leads me to the second point, which is use. I think while uh, the, the examples are still somewhat scattered, uh, I was in, uh, in a news agent last weekend and saw an FT front page story using land registry data to look at who was holding property in the UK in offshore tax havens. 
um, and that was a front page story in the FT, that was a classic example of open data. I mean, in theory, they could have gone and bought data from Company's House five years ago and done this analysis, but they didn't. It needed open data out there for someone to experiment and do that activity and do that analysis, um, which is uh, you know, in a crucial area at the moment. I mean, again, uh, there's front page news yesterday on Bloomberg about offshore uh, money and inequality, which is a big issue politically right now, where open data is directly tying into that debate. Um, I think the converse point, which is one that I think is starting to surface over the last year, is the risk sometimes around open data, and even we have the stories of big data and so on around personal information. And I think, for example, again, I've seen in several countries some even confusion around open data, shared data, and personal data. And so I think one thing is to be very aware um, that uh, as more and more data is around, the aspect that people confuse open data with simply data that's held and the government might be sharing with someone. Um, and questions, I think, more broadly that people are really starting to think about is how do we regulate access to information in the digital age? Um, when there's so much access to this personal information, who should control it? Should you have access? Who should else should have access? And how does that relate to the kind of general data that we share under the rubric of open data? That, that's um, a very good example, I think, of the, the stories um, that, that you referenced, Rufus. But it illustrates this fundamental tension between um, what, is, what the government might think is in its interests or what, it's going to create, what is going to create a problem for it, and the benefits or the principle of them saying they're going to be open and transparent. How do you... Well, I suppose you have to win them over, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think this is... I mean, just to be clear, I think also there's, there's, there's both general information which the government um, has, and then there's the question also of regulating, as we said, personal information, which, which is, a, is a distinct one and, you know, causes controversy on the other side. Um, I think that we are, in some sense, I think we could say that we have seen some of the easiest part of the open data era, I think. Um, having done work in other areas of campaigning, this has been one where it was just like driving a truck through, through. it was so easy, relatively. I think in, in many countries, we're starting to see data sets that are more challenging to get opened up, um, uh, or where it's more sensitive. And so I think we are at a point when I think, and Nigel alluded to it, where we have to, to, to keep pushing, not just the data sets that were easy to get released, but the ones that, that, that are really important. And I think we do have that ahead. I also think, and to echo, I think, Nigel again here, some of the most important data, and I think about essential data, data we need as citizens to be able to take part in our society fully, to hold, to hold governments to account, but also to hold companies to account. And I think companies is another area. You know, it, it seems to be crazy that I can't, that there is an open database of every, you know, of what's in the food I eat, where it came from, mm. or who made the clothes I wear. That is data that is essential data that should be open and which companies ultimately control and which we should be looking to get opened up. Um, it would, um, would it be useful to have um, a government body or an independent body um, that perhaps had a bit more power than the ICO? That, that could help businesses and government um, kind of provide cases of best practice, guidelines. Is there any precedent for that? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think just to say this is a, well, you've, uh, a leading question, but the lack of a regulator in some sense for large parts of the information kind of society is, is a big problem. I mean, we have some like Ofcom in the UK and in other countries, we could debate, but FCC in the US, we've had regulators who've been pretty instrumental in certain parts of communication policy. But to take a really big one, um, who's regulating search? Who's regulating Google? Um, the biggest monopolies in the, de the, the world today, those with the biggest power over what you discover online, are essentially unregulated. But it seems that any uh, attempt to say, well, shouldn't these companies be, be, be regulated is challenged by saying that's not, you know, that's against the principles of free speech. Uh, well, I don't, think, I don't think it follows at all that, to re I mean, regulation can be about, um, you know, can be about access, can be about regulating. I mean, one thing to go back is, if we are going to compel in the UK, the whole debate has been in compelling people to open up data um, in the trading funds, who oversees that? Who, who, who makes trade-offs, who makes decisions, who makes sure that data stays at certain quality? And we're getting a little bit, you know, a little bit detailed, but it's stuff like, you know, the broadband, uh, the broadband question. So I think, I don't think it has to get into free speech here in terms of regulating what, what people are allowed to say online at all. It could be very much into terms of this, this kind of right of access. I mean, to take a fundamental point, um, could you, many businesses, could they start today if they could not get visibility on Google? You know, would you be able to get there? What, what would happen to Wikipedia, just to be blunt, what would happen to Wikipedia if Google decided to move you to page 20? 
I think your traffic, however amazing Wikipedia is, your traffic would go down a thousand, a million fold but overnight. Anyone who's tried to criticise the, uh, criticise the right to be forgotten case has been sort of blasted by kind of, you know, the Silicon Valley uh, lot, essentially, saying, um, well, no, that's against free speech and, you know, you should let them do what they want, just to play devil's advocate. I, I mean, I fail to understand why the regulation of monopoly necessarily impinges on, on the right to free speech. So this I, is, I would just say to them... This is a US my, and yeah. European tension, I think, but I don't know. It might, it might be too niche to go into now, but, but there's but, definitely something to explore in that. Um, so moving on to, to businesses, there is there's a much more tangible benefit for businesses who will open data about their practices and what they do, and money uh, is, is a very sizable part of that. Um, there was a lovely example from TfL, which is that for every one pound that they spend on open data, they make 45 pounds, and if there are similar benefits for every other business, that's a big incentive. Would somebody like to talk to that point? Getting businesses on board? So uh, I'll have a, have a go at that. Um, so, I mean, the, the economic price in open data is uh, enormous. You know, the companies making use of open data, opening up data themselves, uh, there are a number of different studies that put, try and quantify how many billions of dollars uh, are, are in this. Um, and the latest estimate, I think, is from McKinsey. Um, whether you believe it or not is uh, up, to, up to you. Um, but they put the order of uh, sort of five or so trillion dollars around the world from uh, a shift towards open data. And now the benefits uh, come in a number of ways. They come in, uh, frankly, access to a new, new resource. The example that Rufus was using about the FT, you know, that's clearly worth something to the FT. It's why they put it on their front page but they were able to do it because the, the source material that they were working with was freely available and was there, there is open data. Um, but there are also reputational benefits. You know, one of the big uh, scare stories in the last 12 months was um, Tesco's. You know, Tesco's accidentally uh, feeding some of their customers meat that shouldn't have been in their products. And, uh, you know, it was a big, big scandal. CEO had to publicly apologize, and he had a five-point plan of how this would never happen again. And the fifth point was open data about the supply chain, so that the, the customers of Tesco get to see exactly what the chief executive and everybody down the chain inside Tesco's sees about what's going on with their supply chain. And you know, the reason that Tesco's did that is because they were, they were using open data as a tool to bolster the reputation of the business. You know, the third opportunity is uh, kind of a bit like the discussion you were just having around regulation. Uh, using open data to exchange information between companies and the regulators and the public. So everybody can get a sense of what's going on in the market, uh, not necessarily introducing any new regulation, just making what's already there work more effectively, more efficiently, and uh, for the benefit of everyone. Marcus. Yeah, I, I think at some point it's also important to remember where, where we are tying in as a Wikimedia movement into this open data movement. Because as you can see here, there's a lot of open data and it's by far not only Wikidata or Wikipedia today. However, I think in many places we are actually not realizing what kind of business value we already have to companies using data. Um, a year ago almost, I was contacted by somebody from Facebook whom I met earlier at a talk, writing me an email saying, for some straight, we have a problem, basically. We use these language links of Wikipedia to do some kind of internal things, data integration. I don't know the details. I wouldn't be allowed to tell you if I knew, I guess. Um, and we have been crawling these from Wikipedia. And so week over week now, it turns out that our algorithms perform worse and worse. And now somebody has looked into it, and actually they are all gone. Where are those language links? And it was at the time when we had migrated all the language links to Wikidata, where they are now easier to access, but of course you have to know that. And we were basically breaking some uh, not insignificant part of Facebook functionality by uh, doing this change without actually realizing that this is a kind of business we are tied up with. They didn't tell us. So uh, I think in many such places, these things occur without us actually realizing what kind of business value our work also can have and what kind of power we also can have even beyond the Google results we, we get directly. I, mean, I, I would just say, I think, I think the issue is also not just around, the economic value can be in efficiencies as well. I mean, uh, Peter referred to the amount spent that might not need to be spent under different regimes. Um, 
the, the, the extraordinary valuation in the mid-year report just recently, uh, the G20 uh, reported on potentially trillions of dollars of value in open data, a great amount of which resides in the fact that we as consumers don't actually have open access to the price of things. You might think you do with all the recommendation engines in the world, but it's actually not the case that routinely large amounts of, of, of price data is available as open data for immediate comparison in lots of ways. Now, that's uh, not routinely, not in every aspect of, of, of economic life. So there are huge opportunities here for leveling the playing field. So, uh, just a number um, to use uh, in the political sphere. The US government did a survey uh, through Battelle to find out the value it had got from the Human Genome Project. Human Genome Project cost $4 billion. Battelle measured that the downstream value uh, was $740 million, trillion, billion, 140 times more, and that was jobs, products, uh, all sorts of things. This might be a good point to talk more about Wikidata, as you, as you said, Marcus. So we're two years in, and um, it, it has some way to go if it wants to be the sort of, you know, what, if it wants to be to data what Wikipedia is to, to online knowledge, I suppose. But what, what needs to happen to Wikidata, Wikidata to get to that point? And is it right that Wikidata would be the world's definitive home of open data? Well, obviously, we would like to have that as, uh, as what is happening in, I don't know, one year, two years, three years. Um, there's a lot of things that still need to happen around Wikidata. Um, starting with the fact that there's a lot of data still missing in Wikidata that should be there. Um, that has both technical and, and social reasons. Um, and at the same time, we need Wikidata to be used more um, inside Wikimedia, but much more importantly, I think, outside Wikipedia to, for people to build tools on top of it. Um, and we are seeing the first ones now, which are really amazing as starters, but there's so much more that um, should happen in the next years. Is it beneficial or is it risky to, to build up a very centralized um, resource for data. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there's too much risk at one point, or can you prove through the Wikipedia model that right. that works and that it's kind of you know reviewed by the crowd, by the community? Mm -hmm. So Wikidata isn't doesn't have the goal to be the one place where all open data is going to be. Um, quite the opposite, actually. We want a very important part of it and then reach out to other databases, link to them, so that people can easily find them. Yeah, I can only reinforce that. So what a large share of the properties used on Wikidata are actually about connecting to external databases. We want to link in. We don't want to import databases, even if they are openly available. It's not the goal that we centralize all knowledge of the world, and we will never be able to do that in any field. But the unique position that Wikidata can have is that it integrates these different domains and these different interests in one point because everything touches at some place Wikipedia content and the interests of Wikipedia. So it can really be used to bring things together to help data integration and to enable people then to use these resources together that may have not been uh, linked in any way before that. Mm. So that is much more of our goal than to actually host the data. Elizabeth. One really important function that um, something like Wikidata, uh, Wikidata could provide is an archival function because, of course, many in the scientific community and other communities are concerned about the perpetuity of the data. So a large central, neutral, if you will, entity could provide that assurance uh, technically, economically, and politically, if you will, uh, that would be of enormous use to the entire community. And this is probably a good um, overall point, but what could be done more broadly to make data a more accessible tool for, you know, normal people, people that aren't enormously skilled in, um, in working with code or programming? Um, I, think there, I think there are two parts of that. I mean, one, one is to understand, I suppose, I, I mean, 
data, if you like, I think it's slightly different in that there could be a vision where everyone's going to kind of directly get open, you know, boot up their spreadsheet every day and import data into it. Um, I think it's. I think data is somewhat more where there's, there are going to be intermediaries classically. I mean, if you like, whether it's journalists who write articles or other people who write blogs or whatever, data is often going to reach most people through some other form, through a graph they look at today. So I think there's that aspect where we should, ex somewhat differently from other things, we're not expecting maybe everyone in the world to get into their, their gigabyte database or even their spreadsheets. Um, I think the question, though, still could be, um, are there ways that we could connect that more? I mean, just to take a silly one that relates to news, um, it would be amazing if m m news obviously often builds on a bunch of data, you know, for, even in the business section, but it very rarely links back to it. It very quite rarely links back to the source of that information or the raw data that underpin the article or the graph that was built. So you could imagine a world where much more is linked back to that source data, and therefore if people who do want to explore can follow that chain, whereas often that's very difficult to do today. So you can imagine a world of, of kind of the, the true web where things are linked back in that way. I think that's one. And the other is the obvious point, which is that tools are just getting better and better. Um, that allow people to visually or without programming knowledge explore, and I think that will continue that trend very significantly. Um, I think there is an irony of that, which is it also allows, we had the, you know, the correlation is not causation, um, but it, 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 it's, it's, it also allows those kind of things, us also do, to do dumb things more. Um, while it also allows us to do marvelous things, it also allows us to constantly produce, you know, graphs that show that, you know, sales of refrigerators, as was shown in the 1950s, correlated strongly with an increase in crime in New York City that uh, obviously indicated that, that fridges should be banned as soon as possible. Um, and this kind of thing. So I think that, that that is the other aspect, which is that the data literacy side of it. As we get tools that allow people to play very easily, that aspect of understanding a little bit of what people are doing is very, very important. There has been a very lively discussion in the community recently about um, a plugin that can do live visualizations. Can, can somebody talk about, uh, talk about this? Because it yeah, visual let, let, making... me, let, me, let me just get back to what uh, Rufus said. I think the, the problem there is not uh, the correlation analysis of the visualization. The problem is us. That is the problem is we look at the visualization and we immediately think about causes and causality in it. Uh, th that is the problem. It's not, th th the problem isn't that somebody, st stupid or not stupid, uh, correlates refrigerator sales with, uh, with crime rates. It is that we look at it and we make the causal connection that reducing the amount of refrigerators out in, in, in our society would also reduce crime rates. Uh, so once again, I have seen the enemy, and it is us. But, but, so just to, to go on that one, I think that's, that's a really interesting point. But there's, this is an interesting point about technology, right? If we want to get really general, or think about food. So humans clearly have a predilection to sugary, high-carbonate high high stuff. As we enter an age of plenty, at least in some parts of the world, uh, humans have had a tendency to overindulge. Right? And it's, the truth is, the enemy is us, right? We, we like sweet stuff too much, you know? We come from an era when there wasn't, we, you know, we evolved in a period when there wasn't enough food often, so we had a tendency to want to gorge on those kind of things when we, when we got high sugar or high energy stuff. Um, but you still want to take steps to avoid that, that happening. So it's true. So I think my point is that it's easy to produce bad graphs then that humans who are at fault then look at it and go, oh my God, look what's happening. Um, but I think that's one of the things we need to do. Just like we maybe are good about what we eat, we need to be good about what we eat informationally. We need to be cautious about our diet, our information diet, as we're cautious about our food diet. Well, being cautious is, I mean, that, that, that is a trick. Uh, uh, we know, I mean, this is one of the interesting things that's coming out in, in, in our understanding of human cognitive psychology, is we, we do not act as rational Bayesian processors. We don't know how to adjust our estimates, you know? Big surprise. But actually, uh, for years and years, people have been trained as if that were the case. And in a sense, the challenge is, is a literacy and a style of engagement where people can be shown the other hypotheses that could support the data. That, that the fact there are always a range of interpretations, that data should be taken, as you say, uh, with a large uh, 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 set of caveats, and indeed, we are the enemy. And understanding our own predilections is very important. So I think there's a huge educational piece. Just one technical point, though, outside of this. I think that Wikidata is great. I think it's going to be a hugely valuable resource um, uh, just as uh, various points, focal points, nucleation of data sets, really very, very important. Um, but I also think that we need to make data itself more discoverable. 
um, and that isn't always the question that, we ju that, that, that the portal will solve the problem. So I think here, initiatives like schema.org, the, uh, uh, the kind of work that are being done by some of the search engine companies in collaboration to discover data sets by the, cert the powerful search methods we have will also turn out to be important. So there's kind of a two-ended approach, I think, to this challenge. In security, they say that the weakest point is always between the keyboard and the chair, just going back to the, um, how data is interpreted. But I suppose that counts at both ends of the kind of data scale, because it's how the data is gathered and assembled and <coughs> what the methodology is, as well as how it's interpreted the other end. But this is critical, isn't it? It doesn't matter how great the, um, the kind of technical structure around the data. Um, if we're making it really easy to pull data into one central set, there need to be, again, as there are on Wikipedia, very robust systems for checking that that data is right. Yes? Am I wrong? Well, uh, speaking from a, you know, a scientific point of view, uh, we have uh, put in place mechanisms for checking data, and they can be done by both machines and by humans. Uh, I don't think we use machines nearly enough to check data. There are lots and lots of things that one can do to find out whether data makes sense, whether it's internally consistent, uh, whether it's consistent with the uh, rest of the known data, and so on. Um, I was hearing today of people who are putting data into Wikidata manually, and this shouldn't be the first way that we do it. We should be using machines to help us uh, sort that data out and to pre-validate it uh, and only use the humans for the most critical uh, aspects of, of this. I think that's probably true in other fields, but in science particularly, where we have a huge history of um, uh, using and refining data, uh, this is the way we should move towards working. And with governments, not just our own, but in countries where perhaps there's a bit less trust with the authorities, what are the systems and processes that should be in place for making sure, you know, it's the equivalent of the parliamentary, ed parliamentary edits Twitter account or something. What's the equivalent for data? Well, I was, I was going to actually say something, I'll come to that, but on the previous point, I think there is an interesting question, and I'm just going to raise it around Wikidata, which is, I, I, there's a kind of continuum, right? It, it, I, is data, there's kind of this argument, is data more like kind of content, or is it more like code? Um, I personally think data is quite a lot more like data, uh, code than it's like content. Um, and I think that, that, Im, that implies certain things. I mean, one thing to come back to is that Code, for example, hasn't ever ended up with central portals for discovery. I mean, there have been them, but no one actually does. That's not actually how code generally gets discovered. Um, there have been them over history of people going and searching places, but that doesn't how it works that much. Similarly, I think about data, like the fork and pulse, you kind of go about provenance. You know, the question about data quality, partly it's about being able to see the changes made to data. It's partly about fork and pull. I mean, in, in code, security is maybe even more important. If there's bugs or bad stuff in code, you can, you can get into very secure systems. You could shut down nuclear reactors. You know, it's pretty important too. And in some sense, the argument has been, to many eyes, all bugs are shallow. The, the value of openness that many people can scrutinize, that they can correct, that they can see the change log of what's happened, is your best guard against error and against or intentional corruption. Um, and I think that's going to be, that's very, that would be very valuable. And, you know, I think um, certainly for government data, I think one of the things we're in this kind of first phase, technically, where most data is not version controlled. Um, and we could go on at some length about this, but I think that, which is something, you know, obviously central to wikis has been the kind of version control for content. But how we do version control for data is still a little bit up in the air, and how we do it effectively and in a distributed manner. Elizabeth. Uh, to join Peter and Rufus's comments in the scientific arena, checking the accuracy of data is one thing currently done through the peer review process. Uh, but ensuring the continuity of data is another matter. And we have to make sure that the uh, expression of scientific communication is a continuous process that we can enhance data, add to it, relate to it, integrate it, uh, and so that it doesn't become a static entity uh, such as we were stuck with in the days of print communication for science and any other field. Uh, so that's really one of the biggest challenges we're confronting jointly now, certainly in the scientific publishing arena. It feels like a good point to go to a few questions that came from the community. Um, wise woman asked, what do we do when data becomes obsolete, which is something that Elizabeth touched on? Um, are they kept as a record? And what if that data um, were false? 
but still used in some articles. Any ideas on how to deal with that? Great. Can you repeat that question? What do we do when data becomes obsolete? So there's a new set, replaces the old one. It still needs to be archived. Right. So, so basically how we track data integrity on Wikipedia. Yeah, well, you know, where does data go when it dies? Graveyard. Yeah, data graveyard. <laughs> what happens at the moment might be a good place to start. Um, should, should there be a data graveyard? I don't know. Should there be? But that data should still be accessible historically. Right. It? So Wikidata does have a version history just like Wikipedia has for each article. Um, so you can track how data has changed. Um, and then Wikidata also has the means to keep track of historic data to show you how, for example, the number of inhabitants of a city changes um, over time and indicate this was in this year, in this year, in this year, and so on. Um, so there, there are means to, to check the data on Wikidata to make sure it's correct. And I think there's, there's two main area or types of, types of mistake in, in the data. Um, one is basically bad, someone enters something incorrectly unintentionally, a data point here, a data point there. Um, we find this through constraints violation reports, for example, where we, for example, search for people who are older than 120 because that is very unlikely, and then someone can go and check those. Hmm. Um, the other point is systematic manipulation of, of larger parts of a data set, and I think there's a lot of research to be done how how these patterns um, evolve, and Wikidata seems to be a good place to do that research and, and help us find those. Uh, I suppose that the much larger issue here, which Rufus is probably preempting at this point, is that a lot of data formats obviously become obsolete. So how do you future-proof data, yeah. which is a, a massive and very yeah. important issue? I mean, I, I think um, I'm actually talk a little bit about this in the talk later, uh, in my talk later. So it's kind of advertis for that. But I mean, one thing on obsolete, I think there is. It, we've kind of got to a point on content, uh, classic text, where it's so cheap to keep copies that we kind of keep everything. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're kind of used in like now. I don't know Google Drive. You know, if you're using uh, Google Docs, you know, you just have every version of your document back to when you started using it. And I think the trade-off generally with data is it is an order of magnitude bigger. Um, it's why all this stuff is kind of happening in the last 10 years. It's why I think this is the era of small data, in fact. The data I can have on my laptop is now so large as to be significant. Um, big data has always been with us. Um, but I think, so I think the point there is that we are going to an era where we can just keep the copies. Whereas traditionally, we actually have had trade-offs. Like, it is costly. It's a problem to keep it. So I think that that's one answer. I think the other is version control. And I was actually, we have it in wikis, but you know, using Git for data, using, I think we're really getting to a point where version control for data solutions at the scale we need for data is starting to be there. And that will kind of solve some of that problem. Um, I don't actually have a lot to say on the, on the data quality point. But, uh, I mean, this won't be an option either. There'll be certain areas where both legally and in terms of a whole range of other considerations, safety, we will have to keep, and we already do in many engineering and scientific disciplines, uh, provably reconstructable data sets upon which assumptions and models uh, 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 derive certain conclusions. So it is about also looking for best practice, um, and it's about uh, pulling those ideas in. Um, and and it's, it, it's very much about um, a view that, uh, as Ruth was saying, was, is looking into the curation of this as a key asset. The one thing to be a little bit aware, beware of is this notion that actually one day the publication will become redundant, you just publish the data. Of course the narrative, the reason, the argument that the scientist advances in support of the data being taken one way or another, that's key also. So you've literally got to have these two things very closely associated. Um, we want to know, just as we do with the journalists, what sense is being made of this data, and data will bear many interpretations in some contexts. Just to say on formats, I did forget that. I think simple formats rule in data. I mean, obviously it varies, but CSV is amazing. Um, you know, you can version it, it streams. Um, there's a lot that we can do in data to keep, to, to avoid some of the obsolescence we have in other areas. I mean, that doesn't, you know, if you're running an fMRI machine, that's, that's still different. You know, the, the problem is there are always lots of bespoke data formats, but I think we could, lo a lot we can do in simplicity there. Um, but Marcus. it's an option. Sorry. So, uh, 
on the issue of data sets. I think uh, that's, there is a certain point where the analogy with code you made also breaks down a bit for me when I think of Wikidata, because in Wikidata we actually think much more in terms of statements than in terms of sets. And we have this in, in many ways when people come to Wikidata to enter something, they come with a set of data. They have a set of data about people with certain birth date information or a set of cities with population data. But it's not merged into the system as a set which is controlled, which in software, of course, is always the case. You know this is part of my program, this is part of yours, and you, have to, you can't just mix code lines arbitrarily and still have something that you can use. But in data, it's different. In data, you have a big soup, and you can basically mix and match and pick whatever piece of it you are interested in. And I think versioning needs to think about how to take that into account, because one fact may be outdated and another one may still be valid. And of course, you can always replace the whole data set, but the approach in Wikidata is much more to endow every single statement with some context information, with validity about when it was true, how it was measured, where it was stated that this is the case, and then to let people access this whole soup with all the context information and to pick what's right for their context. And so there are really two different issues versioning, like seeing what was the old page looking like, and maybe some errors have been fixed in the meantime, and augmenting with new information that is valid in new contexts that we didn't have yet. I think this is... We're going to change subject completely and just talk about... Um, this was a question that came from one of the Guardian's developers, actually, but he was asking about humanitarian disasters. And um, I don't know if any of you have got any specific examples, but how can and has data been used to... Um, data sharing between governments NGOs, the press, and the public. How has that made a difference in um, humanitarian disasters? Has anyone had any experience of that? Richard? So, um, the, the sort of biggest example recently of that is the disaster response in the Philippines, um, where you know, cat catastrophe hit. Nobody was prepared for it. Uh, the response was all over the place. And one of the first things that the governments, the NGOs, all did was collab you know, basically pool all of the data that they had. Um, you know, it was built on their experience of doing this in Haiti, uh, which was, I think, unmapped at the time when they did it. So uh, all of the NGOs and the governments all contributed to OpenStreetMap and then crowdsourced between them the version of the truth on the ground. They took the same approach in the Philippines, coordinating the response. It, had, uh, it meant that uh, everybody was much more effective really quickly. Mm. Um, and so I, th I think that's a, a very powerful pattern for uh, co trying to coordinate response and also bake in collaboration mm. uh, in responding to these sorts of natural disasters. And we don't hear enough about these really positive examples, I think, oh, as well. really important. And a great forcing function on, on, on both the public and, uh, and governments. Um, we can look at a recent event in the UK where the story was not so good. The floods of uh, 2014 in February, really quite severe, uh, for the sake of openly available environmental data, we couldn't get real-time maps of where was at risk and what the flood levels were and what the consequences would be, which was, uh, for a company, a country that does pride itself on, on being at the front of the pack on this, shows that we still have a long way to go. It's probably worth saying that from the media's point of view, what we're trying to do, and always with technology stories, is we're trying to humanise it, we're trying to explain what difference that makes to you know, to, to people's lives, and not just to technologists, but to kind of everyday people in the streets. So it's very important. Elizabeth? Uh, one example that I'll also be touching on in my remarks this evening is uh, the recent Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, plus, there was some uh, scientific disagreement about which strain of Ebola it was, which is obviously directly relevant to the clinical treatment, the urgent clinical treatment in real time of these patients, and uh, because PLOS Medicine was willing to work with scientists to get the information out immediately and make the data underlying the, the uh, scientific analysis uh, accessible also, we, we were able to share with the world uh, the definitive information that led uh, scientists and clinicians on the ground to understand which strain of Ebola it was affecting people in real time in West Africa, and I have no doubt that it, it literally affected people's lives. Three brilliant examples there. Um, we've, we've got more questions um, from some Wikipedians and a few more points to go over, but we're 
time is moving on. So I just wanted to sort of open the floor a bit, really, and say, what haven't we covered that we simply must talk about today? Is there anything you really need to get off your chest? Nigel's laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it, the universe of challenges is always huge. I mean, where, where, um, you, can, you, can, you can pick ex examples, examples, examples. I think the thing that really motivates communities that are driven to participate, uh, the commons community, is often around compelling use cases. Humanitarian relief is a great example. Health is another one. Um, Great example from Trafford Council up in Manchester, working out where it would locate its defibrillators in public places based on the incidence of heart attack data, which it was collecting, which it published, where the ambulances were going to. We now park our ambulances in places where we know the, core, the, 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 the quickest response time is. Any number of areas where a straightforward data set released and available can make a really sensible and powerful policy decision, and people can get that. Has anyone written that Trafford story? That's, that's uh, we need to get onto that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Well. Okay, anyone else got anything they would like to share with the congregation? I think something we haven't really covered because many of the data sets we think of are provided by some authority that just gives them to us as they are. But this is not the case for wiki-based data. They are always modified and provided by people, and we have touched on the point that maybe editing individual facts is not the effective method of getting there. But in fact, I've just um, spoken to Gerard yesterday and he told me on a good day he can do 100,000 edits per day using tools that help him, but essentially still in a manual way by um, making the decision what to do there. So I think it's an important question for us uh, from the Wikimedia viewpoint as well. How can we enable people to contribute data in effective ways? We don't want them to go through all single statements and edit them, but we still need humans to make the decision what goes in and what doesn't and what's useful and what is not. And I think for this, many new things have to be developed. How do we engage people in this field? Um, Marcus, there's a very detailed question here from um, Bernard Krabina, um, which is, how can Semantic Media Wiki be leveraged as a tool to provide and consume open data? Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, I mean, Semantic Media Wiki, for those who don't know, is a media wiki extension that is run on many sites worldwide by communities who want to collectively gather data. It works a bit differently from Wikidata, um, but there are all kinds of examples where open data is coming in. Um, for example, there are some wikis about natural disasters, indeed, where people, for example, have collected information about uh, the Japan earthquake nuclear disaster and have really crowdsourced a lot of information there and made this data public. So I think most of these sites can, in one way or the other, be viewed as open data contributions. But like we said, with many data sets, the problem is findability. So they are all communities, and they are often detached, and it's hard to get these things together, even though they all use the same technology. And yeah, but I think it can make a contribution. The question is how to get it together, how to integrate. Um, okay, from Promelia, um, what are the current gaps and challenges of converting an open data into open knowledge, and what can we, what can we do to move to a healthier system of knowledge production? It's a very sweeping question. Um, so the gaps and challenges of converting data to knowledge. Anybody? I mean, I, I would say, I think one of the ones clearly is the ability to kind of collaborate. Um, part of that's a tool uh, aspect. Part of it's, I think we just said about communities discovering about each other. But I do think that, I mean, I, we had the discussion about code, but you think of even several areas, the ability to just, for example, send corrections to data sets. So I mean, like, it's great, you know, we've, amazing we've got government opening up data. But almost every government data site doesn't really allow me to submit corrections in a useful way. And there, if you've ever used government data, um, you'll be aware that it's not always perfect, which is understandable. And you know, that's true of any data set. But you know, if you think of where we are even with code, I know it's a lot more technical. But you know, there's been this huge move over the last decade where pretty much any open source stuff that's out there, there's a way to submit patches in a useful way. And that just doesn't exist at the moment. And I think the other aspect, um, was, and I, I still don't know this, I remember being suggested by Soren Oyer, who's a big uh, semantic uh, linked data guy, but it was like kind of data pingbacks. It's very difficult at the moment to connect um, 
data sets with the kind of knowledge that's been produced, with, let's say, the news articles that have been written or the policy papers that have been created or, you know, the apps that have been built. So that, that, that discovery of the knowledge that's been created out of a data set is very difficult to, to, to track either way. I mean, I mentioned earlier that similarly, from the news article, I generally can't find the underlying data set. From the policy paper the government released, I can't find the underlying data set. So that kind of chain between the data and the knowledge is, is very poor, which is bad for both. If only there was some kind of hypertextual, you know, markup language that would enable one page to be linked to another. <laughs> Never mind, maybe one day. Um, Okay, the last question from it's LA2 social, is... It? Pardon? It's a social problem, not an essay attempt. I know, sorry, I was being um, flippant. Um, okay, LA2 uh, says... Um, this is a very good question. Um, to paraphrase, there are a lot of people working very hard um, on open data as a, a hobby, but how, how can that hobby be made profitable? Come and work at the Guardian. Come and pitch your idea to the Open in Data Institute. That's what, uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons that uh, we, we, we set the ODI up was to ensure that we could help encourage and develop a demand side. The demand side, it's all very well pushing the data out there, but what, who's going to use it? And the idea that we could get businesses, new businesses, small startups, to think about new business ideas around here was very much at the heart of one of the principal reasons for setting up. And we've, we've just uh, uh, graduated our first sets of startups, and have our, so we have a, alumni companies now who are, who are, who are doing really, really well. I mean, an example is uh, Transport API, who take the country's open data in transport, tidy it up, represent it in a way that's accessible using API, so you can just consume it efficiently. People City Mapper. <coughs> City Mapper. Ah, you know, there's, there are yeah. there are really so good ideas. Um, there are places to pitch now. So I, I think one of the things is that most people are scared of data. They say, "I'm not a scientist. I'm not a mathematician," <coughs> and we hear this business. You know, the next big area or the big area now is data scientists and these people can earn lots of money and all the rest of it. We actually want to believe that all of us can be involved as data scientists. I mean, I'm very, uh, I like the idea of the OKF School of Data, that the world teaches itself how to manage data, not that there is this group of specialists who do data. Mm. Victor. Um, what to me is quite uh, important here to understand is that uh, for many years we have looked at open data as a way to improve our democratic society, to improve transparency and so forth. Um, when I now go around the world and talk to um, those in the big data uh, industries as, as well as open data people uh, and then engage politicians, what I often hear, what is sort of a new tune, is that open data can become the subsidy of the 21st century given out by governments in order to build up a big data ecosystem. So in the past, subsidies were given in terms of money to startup companies. Uh, but what is the most important thing that they need, st young startups, uh, with uh, cloud computing abilities and so forth? There isn't a huge initial investment, financial investment, necessary anymore to start a big data company. What is necessary is a really good idea and access to data. And access to data, therefore, can be seen as a way by government and other entities to enable uh, the, the build-up of a big data ecosystem, so we should look at the ability to create data subsidies. Mm. Uh, yes, Lydia. So I'm all for people making a living with open data. That's amazing. Um, but this question sounded like doing open data as a hobby is a bad thing. It's not. Um, there's thousands of volunteers on Wikidata all over Wikimedia who do this as their hobby, who love it, and thereby run this project. Um, and it's important that we have them. And that's an amazing thing that we have them. Yes, a, ver a very good point. Let's not forget that. Um, I wonder if Peter or Marcus could talk to um, intelligent systems and automated systems and try and you know, describe what Wikidata and the open data scene, if it's a scene, more widely in you know, a few years' time could look like if um, some of your ideas perhaps um, come to fruition. Uh, so uh, my view is that we can uh, put our communal knowledge into machines and that 
we've sort of got a partnership between machines and ourselves so that whenever we have uh, something which a machine can understand and resolve, it's piped to us immediately. Now, this is not a new idea, but I think it's one that's becoming realizable. And so, for example, if I read a scientific paper, what I want uh, is a machine which immediately says that um, Panthero Leo is the Latin name for a lion. You know, I didn't know that uh, a week ago. Uh, and machines can give us that uh, at 99.9% .9 accuracy for an awful lot of things, an information prosthetic. And we should de uh, hmm. develop the way we present information with this built into the system. An information prosthetic, you can take that one away, that's lovely. Yeah. Marcus. Yeah. Well, uh, if you talk about intelligence, of course, it's an awfully overused uh, term in computer science since decades. Um, but I do think, actually, that especially Wikidata and Wikipedia have a, play a huge role when it comes to creating what is often called intelligent systems in one or the other way. Simply because if you want to model, if you want to uh, behave, have a computer behave like a human, have it giving answers like a human. It makes sense to start with a data set that reflects very much what humans are interested in, what humans actually know. And I think in this case, we are not perfect on any particular area. We are not the best database on proteins, on species, on stars, on celebrities even. But we have a great sample of the core of knowledge that modern internet society is actually caring about. And I think this makes a, is a, is a very important asset if you want to build such systems. Um, Another thing I would like to add is that I think also that the approach Wikidata takes, singling out few facts which many people agree on, rather than having a huge blob of knowledge that you only can do statistics over, has a lot of value also to many approaches to intelligent systems, because you can do automated reasoning, you can do inferencing with it. We already use that in our query answering, that we do subclasses in the hierarchical sense, and there is no almost a unicorn thingy. Either it's a unicorn or not. And when we communicate, we want to know if it is a unicorn or not. And therefore, at some point, you need to discretize. And I think Wikidata, in the end, we might come to the point where we do that statistically, having all the real data and just the world as it is. But I think today, it still makes a lot of sense to have a community make this decision. How should we capture the world? so that it can be useful in a system. And I think this is really a great contribution to intelligent systems. So great thought. OK, we're nearly out of time. I'm going to ask each of you to come up with the, the one thing that you think is the really big challenge, perhaps for you more personally, that needs to be cracked in order to make open data much more, um, much more used, I suppose. We'll start with Elizabeth again at the other end. Uh, I'd say a plus. We've had some uh, significant success with our uh, data policy recently introduced, but we have a lot more work to do in terms of uh, allowing the process to be seamless from beginning to end, both in terms of the facility of uh, making the data uh, uh, available on the part of the submitter and the usability and uh, accuracy and uh, and mineability of the data on behalf of the uh, user. So that whole process is still a uh, work in progress, I would say. And uh, we have much more to do to make it seamless. But I, I believe that it's entirely uh, possible uh, as we focus our energy there. Um. I think I kind of a couple of things, maybe not like, just one thing, but I think I'm also going to kind of go for the value cost trade off. It's not just the biggest value, but what is most likely to happen. I think one thing at the present is I do think we're at a, a slight turning point. We really didn't have much open data five years ago, really. Um, Modular, maybe the federal government. And I think so we've kind of started to get enough. I think the thing right now is about things around quality, and I think particularly about how a distributed community, I mean, the, the things around version control and distributed collaboration that we have for code, and it sounds really tedious, but I kind of think that if, if some of those things were at a kind of point right now, a tipping point, um, where that will then dramatically get better. So what it will mean is the ability for me right now to get data, it's kind of like the iceberg. I can find it, but then I spend like two days cleaning it up or weeks cleaning it up or doing stuff. 
Um, and I think we're at a moment where some of the, the ecosystem around that, the speed at which I can get something, correct something, and share that back with the original person is about to get a lot, lot easier. And if that happens, I think we're kind of, it, it's, a, it's a kind of genuine change in which kind of quantity changes quality. And we really, we really get a step change in the quality of data that's out there and in the way that people collaborate around it. And so I think that's the thing I hope to see. That said, I've been saying that for about eight years, um, so you shouldn't count me. But I, I, I haven't been saying it's going to happen. I mean, say I want to see it, but I really think we're close to that now. Lydia. Um, I think the challenge uh, that we're facing in the, in the future is allowing people to actually edit the data that are being published and to col collaborate on it and how we, how we can scale it up, how, can, how we can build out the communities around it, however they may look. I think the big challenge is to get people in excited about it more excited even than, than we are maybe, and some of you hopefully, because I think when you look at Wikipedia and its history and its portals and sub-projects and even Wikidata, it's almost always the work of a handful of people, maybe just one person doing all the stuff, driving it, and we need to excite this one person to get it done. I mean, in the end, millions might follow and may use it, but at the moment, I think we are at an early stage. We have to find those facilitators that actually make things happen and that, that get behind the data and use it. And I think this is a challenge for the next year. Mm. Richard? Okay. Um, so for me, uh, a couple of people have already taken some of the answers. So uh, it's I'm going to harder I'm, as you go along. I'm, Sorry I'm, about that. I'm going to focus on uh, the people using the data. You know, we talked a lot on the panel about kind of responsible data publishing and data consuming of data. I think getting that to work, getting people uh, producing visualizations that bring people to the the data, get people using the data on a point level so that it's incorporated in their articles and so that you can see data-driven, uh, take data-driven decisions is going to be the, the big thing. Uh, so what we have to do is to make all publicly funded science and medicine completely open. The challenge is social and political, um, and um, I'm so excited about Wikidata because I think this is one of the key places that we can help to accelerate this process. Very good point. Cass Sunstein in the United States has uh, suggested as part of the Open Data Project there that we need to think about how to nudge people into uh, positive behavior, being excited about it, doing more stuff, and so forth about it. Um, but in order to nudge, we need to know what kind of nudging helps and what doesn't. So we need data about open data uh, developers and open data applications and the context in which that flourishes. That, to me, as a researcher, is a challenge to capture that data, to analyze it, and then to put forward recommendations on how to uh, nudge more people into open data development. Meta, very interesting. Um, oh dear, well all the, all the good ideas <laughs> have been said indeed. I'll just echo uh, two points. It is about the people. It's just about people. Don't, and we can't afford just to talk to ourselves. Uh, we've got to excite people in uh, why data is important. And if you look at the million plus active <laughs> citizen scientists, it's clear that people will engage if they feel there's a material point. I think open public research is a particular challenge. Uh, our own community is actually quite recalcitrant and actually we need to set data curation down as one of the canons for doing, and in some disciplines this is true but not in all, effective re reproducible defensible science. And, uh, and to echo uh, Victor's point, this stuff is the stuff of research. We need to get people, the social machines that we have built, how open data features on them are really important questions to us, for, for us to address. Absolutely fascinating. I think as ever, the underlying story through most of the issues we've discussed is tech literacy in the wider world, um, which is a kind of drum I like to, to bang quite a lot because until, until we resolve that issue or at least get some way down the road to solving it, I, I, I just think the, the real potential and opportunity of technology in, in many ways can't be realised. Um, that's been an absolutely fascinating panel. Thank you very much for your concentration. You may now go to lunch.
I'd like to make a brief announcement, if I may. Uh, the talk on Wikidata Toolkit, which some of you may find interesting, has been rescheduled to Sunday morning, because in the afternoon I'm already sitting in a plane to Luxembourg. So just to let you know, check the program. Thanks. <laughs>